Well, good afternoon, folks. Thank you for coming. Uh, we do appreciate you having here, even in the face of the inclement weather. Uh, first, I would like to give thanks and praise to our God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the maker of heaven and earth, and pray that what happens here today will be glorifying to him. I'd like to give thanks to uh, Shabri Ali for agreeing to this debate. I followed his work for a while, and he is an excellent debater, charismatic, knowledgeable fellow, and in my opinion, uh, the best Islamic debater there is today. Uh, and as well, thanks for the Truth of My Days team and the others who helped set this up. So let us begin. Did Jesus rise from the dead? Why are we debating this? Is it important? What is at stake? Well, the central claim of Christianity is that Jesus rose bodily from the dead is the fundamental linchpin of Christianity. If it is false, Christianity collapses. If Christ is not risen, our faith is futile. We are of all men the most pitiable. It's over. But if he did rise from the dead, then as Romans says, he is declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, and he becomes the only person ever to claim to bring God's message of victory over death who actually proved he can deliver victory over death by defeating it himself. Today, there's no shortage of atheistic scholars and secular scholars attacking this claim that Jesus rose from the dead, and it's not surprising. Rising from the dead would be a miracle, and these people do not believe miracles are possible. Uh, but Muslims, of course, know that God can do miracles, so why do they deny the resurrection of Jesus? Here is why. Christians believe that the Bible is the word of God, and by this we mean that while it is written via human authors, such as Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, David, Moses, these authors were carried along or driven by the Holy Spirit in such a way that what ended up on the paper is the very word of God. All of scripture is God-breathed. Uh, Muslims, on the other hand, believe that the Quran is the word of God sent down by God to one man, Muhammad, via the angel Jibreel, and it is the Quran that is entirely the world, word of God and perfect. And here is the rub. Okay? The Bible says clearly, unequivocally, and repeatedly that Jesus was put to death and rose bodily from the dead, while Muslims believe that the Quran says that Jesus was neither killed nor did he rise from the dead. And they can't both be right, can they? So the resurrection of Jesus is the crucial test case between Christianity and Islam. Each of us could simply retreat and say, well, our book is the word of God. It says this and that settles it. But today what we're going to do is different. We are going to look and see which side the actual evidence supports. And here is how. This is a trial, and you folks, you are the jury. I will be arguing the case that Jesus rose from the dead, and Shabir will argue that he did not. And just like an actual trial, each of us must offer evidence. What will count as evidence in a trial? Forensic evidence, DNA, fingerprints. We don't have those for ancient events. But even today, what is the gold standard in a case? It is eyewitness testimony. When it comes to ancient events, all we have is written documentation, and documentation by eyewitnesses is the best possible evidence. Now suppose the defense presents a number of eyewitnesses to support their claim. The other side says without proof, well, those, those, uh, those eyewitnesses, they're not eyewitnesses, they're making stuff up, they're lying. He appeals to experts, but does not bring forth actual evidence to support their views. Which side would you go with? Who would you believe? Uh, there are people, you'll find a lot of atheistic scholars who go this way, will say scholars have found that, modern scholars tell us that, scholars have shown. And there's nothing wrong with appealing to scholars. But reputable scholars base their opinion on evidence. So anyone who appeals to reputable scholars must summarize the evidence on which the scholar bases his opinion. Otherwise, it is simply a logical fallacy known as the appeal to authority. We can cite only authorities steering conveniently away from other testable and concrete evidence as if expert opinion is always correct. 
if all you have are authorities and everyone just has to take their word for it without any other evidence to show that those authorities are correct, then you have a problem. Okay? So please hold both of us to that standard. Make sure we are providing evidence for what we say. Okay? Now, let us begin. Our primary evidence is the gospel books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those four books that contain detailed accounts of Jesus' ministry, works, teachings, death, and resurrection, uh, as well as the book of Acts, which details the early history following Jesus' resurrection. If these books are accurate, the question of the debate is settled right here. But of course, there are people who will challenge that. Uh, this is a typical sort of statement you get from atheistic scholars. Uh, they will tell you that the gospel books are not historically good sources. They were written 35 to 65 years after Jesus' death and not by people who are eyewitnesses. But what do they base these claims on? Let's hear from some of these reputable scholars. Here is uh, Dr. Robert Funk of the Jesus Seminar, co-editor of the Five Gospels. He writes, the Gospels are now assumed to be narratives in which the memory of Jesus is embellished by mythic elements, plausible fictions. Uh, Dr. Gerd Ludemann, one of the most respected scholars in Jesus studies, writes this in one of his books. Three presuppositions underlying my work are the first fo uh, following. First, the authors of the four Gospels of the New Testament are not known. The authors were not eyewitnesses. Look, folks, assumed. Presupposition, what does assume mean? Supposed to be the case without proof. Okay? Presupposition, a thing tacitly assumed. In other words, tacitly supposed to be the case without proof. And this, folks, is why we have to see the evidence and not simply accept what scholars say. What goes into these assumptions? Primarily, it is an anti-supernatural bias. Uh, here is the giant of Old Testament scholarship, Rudolf Bultmann, who tells us it is impossible to believe in a world of spirits and miracles in a day of modern science. Uh, here's Ludemann again, telling us that the account of Jesus prophesying the destruction of the temple must have been written after it happened because, hey, Jesus could not foretell the future. Uh, Dr. Raymond Brown, same thing. Jesus could not have foretold how Peter died, must have been written after the fact. Okay. And again, I see how atheistic scholars would feel that way. But uh, Muslims and Christians both know that God can do miracles and his prophets can foretell the future. Uh, arguments based on these kind of presuppositions simply do not hold water. Okay. These kind of claims that the gospel books are anonymous, that they're written, not written by eyewitnesses, they were late, written late, uh, they expect us to assume it, presuppose it. Let's look at the actual evidence. Actual evidence for the authorship of the gospel books. Uh, we start with the titles that specify the name of the author. And these titles are present in every single gospel manuscript that includes the beginning of a book, even the very earliest ones. Uh, you see it at the top, the Evangelion Kata Ioannin, Gospel According to John. If people want to argue that these books originally circulated anonymously, they have to come up with something. Where is a manuscript without the title? It's not there. Uh, furthermore, we have the testimony of early Christian writers who are in a position to know. Men like Papias, Irenaeus, Tertullian, Clement of Alexandria. Uh, Papias tells us he heard the Apostle John personally, frequently consulted with those who knew the Apostles. Irenaeus was a student of a man named Polycarp who himself was a student of the Apostle John. So we're talking about people very close to the events, people who are in a position to know. People are getting their information from people who knew. Uh, and we can't write them off just because they're Christians. That would be the genetic fallacy. It would be like me saying you have to throw out the Hadith, the Tafsir, the Sirats because they're written by Muslims. Okay? We can't do that. Okay? These were in a position to know. Their testimony counts. Okay? Furthermore, these authors tell us that they were eyewitnesses. Here's John telling us this is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things. Uh, here, John again telling us he's an eyewitness. Peter, whose testimony is recorded in Mark, uh, telling us that he was an eyewitness. He did not follow cunningly devised fables. We were eyewitnesses. We heard his voice when we were with him. Okay. 
How do skeptical scholars attack these? Do they offer any actual proof that these men were not eyewitnesses, evidence to override what we have seen? No. They will attack in other ways. They will claim, for example, that there are discrepancies in the gospel books and ask, what about these? Uh, but they're not contradictions. There are certainly discrepancies. But in fact, the sort of discrepancies in the gospel books is exactly what happens when more than one person records the same event. Because each person chooses what he wants to present and how he wants to present it. A few years back, I wrote up this article. Uh, this Russian hockey player, Rinat Valyev, was interviewed after a game. And understand, the reporters were standing there, all of them at the very same interview with modern day voice recording equipment. They wrote up their stories that very day. It was published in newspaper the very next day. And I pulled out four of the reports of the very same press conference and they were full of exactly the same kind of discrepancies that you see in the gospel books today. An article is on our website, you can look at the details. But the fact then is that these discrepancies are a sign of authenticity, they're not a problem. Uh, many times the accuracy of the record in the New Testament has been attacked and they've always come up smelling like roses, very good history. Luke, for example, the historian, Many charges brought against him. Subsequent archaeological discoveries always proved him to be right. Luke names 32 countries, 54 cities, and nine islands without making a single error. No other Greco-Roman historian even comes close in terms of accuracy. Uh, well, they say, well, what about the differences between John and the other three gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke? How come they're different? Matthew, Mark, and Luke cover much the same area, and John is different. And they will try to suggest that, well, John was writing much later, and the oral tradition had grown, and by the time John is writing, he's putting in this legendary material. Uh, that's a non-starter, though, folks. First, John was an eyewitness. He was not writing down oral tradition. He was writing down his own experiences, his own memories, aided by the Holy Spirit in doing so. And yes, he was writing 32 years after the fact, but it's not a problem to remember things that far back if they're important things once you're past a certain age. I got married 32 years ago. You think I can tell you about my wedding day accurately? Yes, indeed. Okay. The real reason for the difference is the target audience. Luke tells us in his prologue that he is writing to a Christian audience. Mark, we're told that as well. Matthew, presumably. So they're writing to people who know who Jesus is, who know how to be saved, and the, the authors don't have to go over this again. John is the only one who tells us he's writing to non-Christians, he is writing an evangelistic work, he's trying to convince people to believe, which means he has to focus on who Jesus is, his ontology, and how to be saved. And that's why the books are different. So what have we seen so far? The evidence establishes the fact that the gospel books are eyewitness testimony, three of them directly, Matthew, Peter through Mark, and John. What about when they were written? Well, there's several lines of evidence that help us to discover that. One of them is internal evidence. What do we mean by that? The different forms, but one is, are there things that should be in the book if they were written by a certain date that are not there? And that helps us to date it. If you read, for example, a statement, the three most populous nations in the world are China, India, and the Soviet Union, you would know this was written before 1992. There was no Soviet Union after that. Okay? Or if you read uh, the... World Trade Center is a complex of buildings that stands in Lower Manhattan. You know that was written before 9-11. Yeah. Are there things like that in the Gospel book? Certainly. Uh, there's no mention, for example, of the destruction of the temple, even though Jesus' prophecy about it is recorded. That happened in AD 70. Minor prophecies, record, uh, fulfillments are recorded. Why not this one, if it had happened? Uh, the major persecution under Nero in AD 64 not recorded, although minor local persecutions were. No mention of the death of Paul in 68, Peter in 64, James the brother of Jesus in 62, although the death of James the apostle is recorded, which happened earlier, and even the death of the minor character, Stephen the deacon. So these should be there if that happened. The only conclusion, reasonable conclusion, is the book of Acts was written in the year 62 at the latest. Luke was earlier. Mark earlier than that, uh, and Matthew earlier still. Second line of evidence, external evidence, was called the uh, Family 35 Colophons. These are notes that are written at the end of each gospel book in about 150 different ancient manuscripts, 
written by the original scribes stating when the book was originally published. And these are the dates the Family 35 coffins give us. Matthew, eight years after the ascension of Christ, which is AD 40 to 41. Mark, 10 years after, 42 to 43. Luke, 48 to 49. John, 64 to 65. Okay. We have a third line, the testimony of Eusebius, who addresses the date of Matthew and Mark. And he says, uh, Matthew was published in the third year of Caligula. Different way of, than the uh, Colophons say, and yet converging on exactly the same date. Uh, he tells us Mark was published in the third year of Claudius. So we have three independent lines of evidence converging on these dates. Uh, let's sum up what we've seen so far then. The evidence from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John being the authors, eyewitness authors, and publishing the gospel books at early dates, we have the manuscript titles. We have the testimony of early Christians in a position to know. We have internal evidence. We have the family 35 colophons. And we have the testimony of Eusebius. What about the evidence that the gospel books were originally anonymous and written 35 to 65 years later by persons unknown? We'll put that on the screen now. There it is. There's the actual evidence, unless, of course, you accept this. We assume that they were not written by eyewitnesses. We presuppose that they were written 35 to 65 years later. What should we uh, conclude from this evidence? The gospel books are eyewitness testimony published in the order Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and respectively at these early dates. Well, we saw that Dr. Arman told us these are not really good historical sources. Well, how would you know? Let's compare them to other historical sources of contemporaries. Alexander the Great, five ancient accounts of his life and career, but Durilius was written more than 300 years after he died. The two emperors who ruled the greatest empire on the planet at the time Jesus walked the earth, Caesar Augustus and Tiberius, five ancient accounts of Augustus, but only one eyewitness. For Tiberius, only four accounts, only one eyewitness, and that takes his career only to the year 29, even though these were emperors. Uh, one more example, Julius Caesar's Gallic Wars. It's the only ancient account of the Gallic Wars, and he wrote it himself. Can you say bias? Now... The books are established. What do these eyewitnesses tell us about Jesus' crucifixion? Uh, they tell us two things. One, he died. Two, he rose again from the dead. Here's Jesus' own testimony to that effect. Here is the eyewitness John telling us that. Here is John again. Uh, and Peter, in their early preaching, in just a very short time after Jesus rose, this is what they say to the crowds. You killed the originator of life whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. And again, uh, in Acts chapter 10, notice the three points they're always making. Jesus was killed. You killed him and you know it. God raised him and we are witnesses. We ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. Okay? And the list just goes on and on through the uh, New Testament. And do understand, these people are not gullible. They were not expecting Jesus to rise from the dead. They were very hard to convince uh, the empty tomb did not convince them. The testimony of the women and the first people who saw him did not convince them. Jesus had to appear to them, and even then it was hard. <laughs> when he showed up, at first they thought, well, maybe he's a ghost. And he had to say, here, touch my body. Put your fingers here into the holes in my hands. Put your hand into the hole in my side. Still having trouble, but he has to eat with them. In the end, he's with them for 40 days, showing himself alive by many infallible proofs. And in that time, they are certain. Okay. They weren't expecting it. They had to accept it. Did they lie? Some people will say, well, they simply lied. Well, that would be possible if they got something out of it, if they got some big benefit out of this story. But what was the message they were passing on? Love your enemies. Turn the other cheek. Deny yourself. Take up the cross. Follow me. You will be hated by all men. The days will come when people will kill you and think they're doing God a service. Who is going to accept that kind of message unless they really believe Jesus can give them eternal life? And these things did come to pass. They faced terrible persecutions, uh, exquisite punishments, is called by Tacitus, killed by dogs, nailed to crosses, set aflame, used as nighttime lamps, and yet... They, not one of them said, okay, I admit it, we lied, don't kill me. Not one. Okay. Well, maybe they made up the stories. You know, maybe they just really wanted to, they, they loved Jesus and they wanted people to believe him, they made up the stories. Look at this list of names, folks. Any idea who these are? I'll bet you can't tell me one of them. These are some out of the more than 50 people in history 
who claim to be the Jewish Messiah. Some before Jesus, some after Jesus. How come you never hear of them? How come you never hear of them? Because a messianic claim and a Jewish Messiah who dies and stays dead is a fake Messiah. Nobody follows him anymore. No one makes up stories about him. Coming back from the dead, no one preaches him. And this is not just ancient history. Meet Menachem Schneerson, who was the rabbi of the Chabad Lubavitcher sect of Orthodox Judaism. By the 1980s, he was being promoted as the Messiah. Schneerson died in 1994. What happened? According to the Washington Post, uh, even as his pine coffin was placed in the hearse, a panicked crowd of Lubavitch faithful chanted prayers for Schneerson to rise and reveal himself to be the Messiah. So if you're the Messiah, you have to come back from the dead. Did he come back from the dead? No. Within three days, the movement was already sundering. Well, folks, it's not three days anymore. It's 25 and a half years. Schneerson hasn't risen yet. He's not going to. Okay? Nobody is out there making up stories that they saw him. Nobody is preaching him. Nobody is converting people to Schneersianity. Okay? And why is that? Because people follow a messianic claimant for a reason. They believe he's the Messiah. They believe he will give them victory and eternal life. If he dies in defeat, he has proven that he cannot give them those things. So why would they make up a story that he came back from the dead to legitimize him when they know he can't give them those things they're looking for? Now, some accuse Paul of making this up, but we've seen the gospel writers were eyewitnesses. And people who spent three years with Jesus, knew him intimately, spent 40 days with him after he rose back from the dead, are not going to change their minds about who he was because some guy comes along later who never even met Jesus and says something different. Paul didn't make this up. But he does provide us with some very important evidence. People in Corinth at one point were beginning to question the resurrection, and Paul said to them, he reminded them, Christ died, he rose again the third day, he was seen by Cephas, which is Peter, then by the twelve, then by over 500 brethren once of whom the greater part remain to the present. So he's telling them, there's more than 250 eyewitnesses that you can check with if you're doubting this. Would they have checked? Well, in a day and age where you're going to be persecuted, maybe killed for following Jesus, and you can be sure, you're going to check. What would have happened if they checked and the eyewitnesses were not there to back up the story? Christian would have died instantly. It wouldn't be here today, yet here it is. Okay. People have been known to die for a lie, but only if they believe it's true. Nobody knows for, dies for what they can check and know to be a lie. Okay. Another attack is made saying that the, the resurrection accounts in the gospel of books, the four gospels, they cannot be reconciled. They're hopelessly contradictory. And I wonder about people who said that, whether they ever tried to do it. Because really, you should be able to sit down with a Bible, and about an hour you should be able to reconcile everything. Here's our account, fully reconciled, every single detail included, no contradictions. Of course, we don't have time to go through it in detail, but it is on our website. You can check it out. So there you go. What are you going to do now if you still want to deny that Jesus came back from the dead? There's one way to go, and that's to claim that Jesus didn't actually die on the cross. People thought he was dead. But he actually was, just went unconscious, he was put in the tomb, they thought he was dead, and he, he just resuscitated after, and people thought he rose from the dead. Is that possible? Well, let's ask, could Jesus have survived the crucifixion? To answer that, we have to know how crucifixion worked. The victim is nailed to the cross. In that position, uh, his rib cage gets distended. He cannot exhale he properly. He cannot breathe the way we do. He has to push himself up by his feet in order to exhale. As he sinks down, he inhales. He has to keep pushing himself up and down, up and down just to stay alive. It is excruciating pain. Uh, meanwhile, there are terrible physiological effects on the body. On the respiratory system, you get shallow breathing, hypoxia. There's a lack of oxygen because you're not breathing properly. Uh, eventually asphyxiation. On your cardiovascular system, the heart and the lungs, uh, ischemia, tachycardia, racing heartbeat, heart attacks, heart failure. And meanwhile, inside your body, plasma is being extravasated into sacs around your lungs and possibly around your heart as well. Uh, plasma, which is 92% water. 
Eventually you die one of three ways, either heart eventually gives out and you die, you might get a catastrophic heart failure. If you survive those, you're going to push yourself up and down for days, perhaps until you're too tired to do it, and then you will die of asphyxiation because you can't breathe anymore. Okay? So could Jesus have survived? I'll give you two reasons why he could not have. Okay? Number one, uh, as our eyewitness tells us, after he was dead, one of the Roman soldiers spoke to him in the side with a spear and blood and water came out. Well, we know the only way that happens is that Roman spear point penetrated into one of those lungs filled with the fluid. That's the water coming out and went all the way into the heart. That's where the blood came out. So even if he hadn't been dead by that time, he would be dead now. Okay? Well, what can skeptics do in that? They're just going to have to try to deny. They're going to have to deny that it even happened. Okay? They would say things like, most historians say that the spear wound mentioned in John isn't historical. John added it for theological reasons. He just introduced it. It didn't really happen. Uh, if that were so, it wouldn't matter because these people are not eyewitnesses John was. But it isn't actually true. It isn't actually true. Uh, from the very liberal Oxford Bible commentary, uh, we're told that, yes, there are some people who think the blood and water wasn't historical. Some others think even the spear thrust wasn't historical. So this is not most. This isn't even the majority. This perhaps isn't even uh, many scholars. And then the, the liberal commentary goes on to tell us that all these reconstructions are merely hypothetical. In other words, scholars who say that are just pulling it off the top of their heads, no evidence for it. Okay? And he goes, and the evangelist, the eyewitness, tells us both of these happened. So he was dead. Okay. Second reason, could Jesus have survived the crucifixion? Well, we have to look again how crucifixion worked. Remember, you have to keep pushing yourself up to breathe, sinking down, up and down, up and down, okay? until you're too exhausted. You can't push yourself up anymore. You stop breathing. You die. So what if you did swoon? What if you did go unconscious? If your brain sensors are going to wake you back up, so you're going to continue, you don't look dead, or you stay unconscious. You stay swooned, and if you do, you can't breathe, and you die. Okay? So if you die, you're dead. If you swoon, you're also dead. So there's no way he could have survived the crucifixion. Okay? So could he have the answers are resounding? No. Okay? He died, and as, as we have seen bountifully, he rose from the dead. Where can the skeptics go now? Well, there are a few more increasingly desperate and risible gambits, none of them valid. Uh, but we are out of time to discuss them. Uh, the logical conclusion then, based on the actual evidence, is this. The gospel books are reliable eyewitness testimony published early, 8 to 32 years after Jesus' ascension. They established that Jesus did miracles, was killed by crucifixion, and rose from the dead, Q-E-D. All the challenges brought against their trustworthiness have been shown to be bogus. Uh, they are further supported by other evidence, including the eyewitness challenge of 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 8. So that, folks, is what the actual evidence has to say. And as we've already seen, because he rose from the dead, he has been declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. And that is why the church was born and grew in Jerusalem. Why thousands of Jews who are trained from birth not to bow the knee and call Lord anyone other than God were bowing the knee to Jesus and calling him Lord. If not the resurrection to explain it, then what? What else could explain it? Okay. Now, my time is done. Shabir will come up now and he's welcome to challenge what I've said. I'm sure he will. Uh, but it requires countervailing evidence of a sufficient wait to overturn what I've said. So uh, I'm done, and uh, let's listen to Shebio now. Thank you. That's fine. I guess that would be fine. Thank you, John, for your opening presentation. Before I proceed to presenting uh, Dr. Shabira Lee, 
would also like to mention, I understand that this uh, debate is being live streamed. For those of you who are viewing online, you also have an opportunity to submit questions. You may submit them through the live stream chat, and uh, those will be collected by the end of the first break. I also want to mention, as you may have noticed, the time allotted to each speaker for their opening presentation is 30 minutes. Uh, at the conclusion, I will come up uh, when Shabir has finished his presentation uh, to make mention of our break and then the format of which we'll proceed involving the first response, second response, and then concluding reflections, which we then will have another break and a period of Q&A. Well, Dr. Shabir Ali holds a BA in Religious Studies from Laurentian University in Sudbury, Ontario, with a specialization in Biblical Literature. He also holds an MA and a PhD from the University of Toronto with a specialization in Quranic exegesis. He is the president of the Islamic Information and Dawa Center International in Toronto, where he functions as Imam. He travels internationally to represent Islam in public lectures and interfaith dialogues, and he explains Islam on a weekly television program called Let the Quran Speak. Please welcome Dr. Shabir Ali. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for that uh, warm uh, introduction and for your cheering. Thank you, uh, uh, Stephen, for uh, that generous introduction. And uh, thank you, John, for sharing this platform with me. And uh, I'm so delighted to, to be here with you today to present uh, my thoughts humbly on this uh, very important topic. As Stephen pointed out and also John po pointed out, uh, it is a very important topic for Muslims and Christians to understand better. Uh, our event is billed as a debate. I wish it were billed as a dialogue because I, I really uh, sincerely feel that we need to understand each other more and uh, we will do that better through dialogue rather than debate. What's the difference? The, the word debate conveys to my mind that it's going to be proof and disproof. Somebody's trying to prove the other person's religion wrong. I would rather that Muslims and Christians together cooperate in battling many of the common evils that we face in the world. And uh, one of those, uh, from, from the point of view of faith, is non-faith. Uh, John, in uh, one of his recent uh, articles, uh, pointed out that uh, there is an alarming statistic of young Christians having doubts about the Christian faith. And I can confess that uh, it is alarmingly so as well among Muslims, that young people are questioning uh, their uh, faith. So what do we do in an atheistic world that is becoming increasingly atheistic and ungodly? Uh, I believe that people of religion need to band together and present a, a unified front uh, to deal with all of these challenges uh, to faith. Well, one of the ways of dealing with those challenges, uh, and this may be the positive aspect of our debate tonight, or this afternoon, is that uh, in, in such uh, occasions, we get a chance to think more rationally about our faith as our faith is being questioned by the other side. And by thinking more rationally about our faith, we may, in the end, come out with uh, an approach to our faith uh, that is more rational and that will commend uh, itself more to our youth, whether they be Christian or Muslim. And in doing so, uh, we will be in a better position uh, to guard against uh, the onslaught, especially of the new atheism. Uh, one of the things that uh, the atheists uh, do question is the idea that God performs miracles. And in fact, uh, we do not need atheists to question that. Uh, we find that uh, many uh, Muslims and Christians as well are rational people, and they like to see everything done in a rational away. They, they believe that God does things uh, in a systematic and uh, a normal uh, manner, and by that we mean the manner that conforms to what people refer to as natural laws. And so when we speak about a miracle, uh, this naturally will be questioned not only by atheists but also by people 
of faith. Now, as I customarily would have begun, and let me do so now, with praises for our creator and fashioner, the creator of the heavens and the earth. I ask you, God, to send peace and blessings upon all of his prophets, his messengers, and all of the righteous people of all time, and on all of us here today. Now, I have invoked God, and here the atheist is not going to be very happy. But we're not here to please the atheist. We're, we're here to understand our faith ourselves. Now, uh, Muslims believe that Jesus was uh, one of the greatest men who walked the earth. The Quran, which is a Muslim scripture, uh, speaks of Jesus uh, in glowing terms and never criticizes Jesus, uh, from, at least from a Muslim point of view. Everything the Quran says about Jesus is positive. The Quran calls him by many uh, important titles. He is the Messiah. He is a servant and prophet and messenger of God. Uh, the Quran uh, gives us the story of uh, the Annunciation to Mary. And Mary says, how can I have a child when no mortal has touched me? And she's told, so it will be, because when God decrees a thing, he only says to it be, and it becomes. The Quran details some of the miracles uh, of Jesus, including uh, the statement in the Quran that Jesus healed the blind and cured the leper and raised the dead. And here again, obviously, uh, people uh, of the atheistic bent are not going to be very happy. Uh, the Quran uh, says that towards the end of Jesus' career, uh, there was an attempt to crucify him, and God rescued him and raised him to himself. Now, at least uh, Muslims and Christians uh, agree on one thing, and that is that God raised Jesus to himself. But uh, here, too, we must be more specific. Um, we are both uh, calling here uh, for a miracle, or we're identifying a certain event in our history uh, that we deem to be a miracle. Uh, but I will say that uh, Muslims have a certain degree of leverage in interpreting the Quran. Now, the Quran itself tells us that there are uh, verses within the Quran uh, which are very clear. These are referred to as the mother of the book. Where do we find this statement? In the third chapter of the Quran in the seventh verse. And at the same time, this verse says that there are other passages in the Quran which are not so clear. They are called in Arabic mutashabihat, which means that two different or, or sometimes multiple meanings can present themselves and one looks as good as the other. That's why they call mutashabihat. You can't distinguish uh, the, the truth of one from, from the other. So that means that there are passages in the Quran that lend themselves to multiple interpretations. And we see in the classical commentaries on the Quran, uh, I have Imam Habib here in, in the office, in, in, among the audience, and he can confirm this. This is what uh, all Muslim scholars know, that the classical commentaries on the Quran, written in Arabic um, hundreds of years ago, even a thousand years ago, uh, give multiple meanings to various words of the Quran and to various passages of the Quran. There are also modern interpretations that may not have been so well considered in ancient uh, times. Now, we, we ask what modern uh, commentaries can be accepted? How do we distinguish? Well, we go back to certain basic principles. Uh, the first principle is that the Quran will interpret itself. So if something is not clear in one passage, it may be clearer in another passage, and that rules. We cannot give an interpretation of our own if the interpretation is already clear from the Quran itself. Namely, from another verse that uh, we, we um, will now bring into consideration. Uh, if there is a clear statement from the Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace, that would trump any other person's uh, statement. So the statement has to be clear uh, that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, says that this verse means that, uh, or he said something else which is so clear, and then it must be authentic as well, uh, because anybody could have said that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said X, Y, Z, but how do they know? Did they meet him? Uh, or if they're reporting from somebody else, did, are they reporting from somebody they actually met and who actually met the Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace? So there, there's, there's a process of authentication of the statements. If there is, there is then a state, clear statement from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, that is authentic on the question, well, that rules. And I cannot stand here as a Muslim and give you a different uh, interpretation. 
Now we can go on, but uh, for a limited time, these are some of the most uh, important principles. Now when it comes then to the ascension of Jesus, uh, classical commentaries uh, said that God took Jesus, both body and soul, and raised him into heaven. Now this, the verse that they're looking at uh, in the Quran says, I'm going to raise you to myself. This is God speaking. And uh, the uh, great commentator on the Quran, Al-Imam al-Razi, said that it couldn't mean that he literally, that Jesus is being raised to God self, because God does not have a direction. Like we can't say God is literally up there. We say so for convenience and out of honor for God, like we look up in our prayer and so on. Uh, but uh, God is not to be said to be literally up there. And by the way, our up there is actually down there for uh, those who are in Australia. And uh, may, may God save them from the devastating effects uh, of the recent uh, fires. And of course, uh, this is a moment, as we recall, uh, for us to pray for people who are suffering all over the world for various reasons, especially those who recently died in the uh, air, airplane tragedy in Iran. Uh, so, uh, Muslims then, uh, looking at this uh, passage, they, they have some scope for interpretation. Uh, whereas the classical commentators would have said that God raised Jesus' body and soul into heaven, uh, modern Muslims may think that God raised the soul of Jesus because that is what is actually important. The, the body for Muslims is not so important, this physical body of this life. In the life hereafter, God will give us new bodies that are suitable uh, for the life hereafter. So Jesus may have been raised uh, spiritually. And uh, in that case, we can look at the gospel according to Luke, where Jesus uh, is reported to have said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And Jesus was on the cross, the gospel of Luke says, and before he died, this is what he said. Now, Muslim commentators on the Quran uh, often said that Jesus did not die on the cross, and uh, God put him to sleep and took his soul. Uh, and some said, of course, body and uh, soul. Uh, we can understand then, uh, a Muslim can take this position, this is a possibility for a Muslim to say, well, there it is, right there and then, God took the soul of Jesus, put Jesus into a sleep, a deep sleep, so that he appeared to be dead, and uh, everybody proclaimed that he was dead, but God has his own way of rescuing Jesus and raising him uh, to himself. More needs to be said about this, but I must uh, continue for a limited time, and more details can come out in the, in the Q&A and in response to uh, the questions that will be raised by my good friend uh, John Tors. Another important consideration among Muslims is uh, a passage of the Quran in the fourth chapter, the 157th uh, verse, which says, uh, they killed him not, nor did they crucify him, but so it was made to appear to them. Classical Muslim commentators almost unanimously said that this means that Jesus was not even put on the cross. Here they took the, uh, the term crucifixion in its most literal sense possible. They gave it every possible meaning. Crucifixion can mean two things. One, it can mean hanging a person as, as, as a means of executing him, regardless of whether or not the execution uh, was actually successful. So the mere act of hanging the person could be called crucifixion. Where do we see a meaning like this? In Mark's Gospel, when Mark's Gospel says that it was at the third hour when they crucified him. It doesn't mean that he died in the third hour. It means that that's the, the hour when they hung him on the cross. So merely hanging a person on the cross is called crucifixion. But crucifixion uh, also uh, can be used in hindsight about a person who was executed by that means. When, for example, a Christian says, Jesus was crucified for our transgressions. The Christian does not mean that he merely hung on the cross. The Christian means that he hung on the cross until he died. So then, crucifixion, you can see, can have two basic meanings, whether we're speaking English or Arabic or Greek or uh, Hebrew or some other language. Uh, one meaning is the person merely hangs on the cross. 
without any commentary on whether he dies or not. Uh, second meaning, the person hangs until he dies, and that usually is the intention behind uh, crucifixion. So when the Quran then denies that Jesus was crucified, when it says, ma kataluhu, they did not crucify him, was the Quran denying both meanings? That's what the classical commentators said. But I will submit before you humbly that it does not have to deny both meanings. The Quran could be denying the second meaning, the idea that they crucified him until he died. And the Quran is not necessarily denying the idea that Jesus hung on, on the cross. If we allow for the possibility that Jesus was put into a sleep, into a coma, those states by God, and under God's supervision, he was brought down from the cross, preserved, and then eventually his body was raised into heaven uh, where it is preserved and where, from where Muslims believe that eventually uh, Jesus will come back uh, into, uh, to earth for a second uh, time. Now, of course, many Christians will be listening to this and saying, well, wait a minute, our Gospels do not allow for that. Our Gospels say that Jesus actually died. And, and, and John uh, Torres did give an able defense of that position, that it, it's clear that Jesus died according to the Gospels. But I'll come back a little later to examine that idea a little bit more carefully to see if indeed there is any possibility for Muslims to look at the Gospels and say, well, wait a minute, it looks to me that even though the Gospels are saying that Jesus died, and even though this was a widely uh, proclaimed uh, testimony of uh, many early Christians that Jesus died, uh, perhaps he didn't actually die. I, I will have to come back to that point. But uh, for the moment, I wanted to put before you that Muslims are not approaching this from the point of view of atheists or disbelievers. Muslims are approaching this from the point of view of how do we defend Jesus in the light of non-belief. Now let me uh, explain that a little bit further. The Christian story in the Gospels say, uh, the Christian stories say that uh, Jesus was crucified under the Roman authority, Pilate, and everybody knows that crucifixion was a Roman form of execution. But nonetheless, the Gospels place the blame for Jesus' death squarely on the Jews. Historians look at that now, and they say that these Gospels were written in hindsight, by Christians at a time when it would not have been popular for Christians to oppose the Roman government. In fact, in the New Testament itself, they said a lot of things to placate the Roman government. We find this in the, in the writings of Peter and in the writings of Paul, for example. So that even though the Roman government had recently crucified Jesus, here we have Christian writers praising the Roman government as an agent of God, enacting justice on behalf of God. So on the one hand, there is a need to placate the Roman government, and, on, uh, and so the, uh, the, the, the Roman government is exonerated in this whole scenario of the crucifixion of Jesus. And on the other hand, there is a tendency uh, to blame the Jews. And so... With these two points in mind, the crucifixion comes across in the Gospels as the work of the Jews. They bent and twisted the arm of Pilate and made sure that Pilate crucified Jesus, even though Pilate was reluctant to do that, and he even washed his hands in public of the whole affair. So the Romans uh, exonerated, the Jews implicated. The Jews came up with their counter-narrative, and this is mentioned in the Babylonian Talmud in Sanhedrin 43a. This was uh, brought to uh, my attention in an article uh, by Ian Meverak, writing in the Journal of Religion and Society. Ian Meverak says that when the Quran says they killed him not, nor crucified him, the Quran is responding to the Jews who, in the Babylonian Talmud, took full responsibility for crucifying Jesus, but with the addition that they are claiming that they were right to do so. They said that they charged Jesus with sorcery because he was doing acts of black magic and, and, and sorcery and witchcraft. And the penalty for that is death. 
And while he was under this charge, they put out an open proclamation for anyone who had anything to say in Jesus' defense to come forward. And they would have halted the proceedings to crucify him, or rather to, to stone him, because that was their method, not to crucify, but to stone. They would have halted the, the proceedings to stone him at any moment, had anyone come forward with any viable defense of Jesus. And even as they were leading Jesus out to be stoned, they said that if he himself protested and he had anything reasonable to say, they would again stop and listen to him and give him a fair hearing. So from the Jewish point of view, according to the Babylonian Talmud, they did everything that is right according to their law, which is God's law, according to them. And they, yes, they killed him, they're saying, but we did everything right. And by killing him, they want to imply that he is the false prophet, he's the false messiah. So it's with this in mind, according to Ian Maverick, that the Quran says, no, they didn't kill him. And they didn't even crucify him. So the Quran is defending Jesus against the accusations of the Jews in the Babylonian Talmud. And I say Jews here not to generalize. We don't mean all Jews of all time. We're talking about those Jews in the time of the Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace who were making this claim. And the Quran is answering their claim. So then we realize then that the Quran is not saying that Jesus was not crucified. The Quran is saying they, the Jews, did not crucify him. So whether we're looking at the Babylonian Talmud, which says that they killed him, the Quran is saying, no, they didn't kill him, or we're looking at the Christian Gospels, which say that the Jews are responsible for crucifying Jesus. Now the Quran is saying, well, no, they didn't crucify Jesus either. And historians come away from this saying, well, well you know what? The Quran is technically correct. Jeffrey Parander, a Christian writer, in his book, Jesus in the Quran, says that the Quran actually is correct because crucifixion was a Roman punishment, and it's the Roman that crucified Jesus, not the Jews. So when the Quran says that the Jews didn't crucify him, the Quran is correct. The Muslim commentators took it to mean that he was not crucified at all. And this has become a general understanding among many common uh, Muslims. But it is not a necessary understanding from the Quran itself. So now, Having laid out the Quranic ground, uh, sub to some items which I must return, I want to turn uh, to look at the Christian uh, position regarding this and how uh, this may be uh, approached. When we come to a debate like this, we must understand the uh, neutrality that we must bring to it. If I am saying, Christians, you must believe in what the Quran says, I must first present good reasons for why you should believe that the Quran is the word of God. Otherwise, why should you believe the Quran? Now, it so happens that I'm not asking Christians tonight to believe in what the Quran says. I'll be asking Christians actually to look more carefully at their gospels to see if there is something that was actually missed previously that you need to take into consideration. So I'm not asking Christians to believe in the Quran. So I don't need to present the Quran as the word of God and arguments for the Quran as the word of God. Likewise, if Christians want Muslims to believe in the gospel narratives, they may have to present evidence that the Bible is the word of God. Now, now John rightly presented not the Bible not as the word of God, but as ancient testimony. And so he presents natural, historical pieces of evidence to prove that this is ancient testimony. So he's on the right track. He's not saying this is the word of God, therefore you must believe it. In it. If he's going to say that, then obviously he will have to present evidence for that. Now we come to burden of proof. Uh, the, the title of a debate is worded just as you see it there. Did Jesus rise from the dead? Now this presents to Christians uh, the, the burden of proof. They have to give solid and good evidence to show that Jesus actually rose from the dead. And it's not necessary for the Muslim to prove that he did not rise from the dead. The Muslim only has to question the positive evidence and say, well, wait a minute, that evidence does not actually add up. There, there is another reason outside of debate that Christians have a burden of proof in this matter. You see, the, the, uh, the New Testament presents Jesus as having died under the curse of God's law. Christians tell us, and Christian apologists generally say, that 
if Jesus was crucified and that was the end of the matter, this would prove that he's a false prophet, false messiah. He, he's, he died under the curse of God's law. Uh, because Paul said anyone who hangs on a tree uh, dies in a cursed death, according to the book of Deuteronomy. I believe he misunderstood that passage, but nonetheless, this is how the matter stands. So now, think about it. Jesus dies publicly, and this means that he is a false prophet. But, a few days later, he arises from the grave, and this proves that God has vindicated him, and God is with him, and he is a true prophet and messiah of God. But this is a private affair. Jesus appears only to a few people, even if we count the 500. But I'll question the 500 later on. But uh, uh, Peter, in, in the Acts of the Apostles, says that Jesus did not appear to everyone. He appeared only to those who had come up with him from Galilee. So chosen disciples and followers. In that case, it's a public demonstration that Jesus is a false prophet, but then there is a private vindication showing that he is the true prophet and true Messiah of God. So now Christians, those who are privy to that private vindication, they have the responsibility to go convey to the world the proof that Jesus actually rose from the dead. Because the world, knowing that Jesus was crucified, should conclude, according to Christians, that Jesus was the false Messiah until they come to know of good evidence showing that Jesus actually rose from the dead. There's another angle to this. The, the Gospels go out of their way to show that Jesus uh, was the Davidic Messiah. He was the son of David, he's, and so on. Now, what was the Davidic Messiah? The Davidic Messiah was to uh, overturn Roman rule and institute the law of God on the land. What Muslims call the Sharia, or the law of God, Christians also had that concept, although generally it doesn't seem so that much anymore. But Christians still, in their prayers, the Lord's Prayer says, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. They want, at least this prayer is announcing, that we want the law of God to be executed here on earth as it is already in heaven. So that it's the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of Rome or, or some other kingdom. Well then, if Jesus was the Davidic Messiah, then he had to overthrow Roman rule. And the Jews can say to Muslims, well, wait a minute, you say he's the Messiah, but he didn't overthrow Roman rule. And Christians will say, but wait, when he comes back, that is when he will rule. That is when he will be a king. And the Jews will say, well, okay, so when he comes back, we'll see that he's a king, and then we'll know that he's the true Messiah. But for the moment, it looks like he's a false Messiah. He claimed to be a king, but he didn't actually turn out to be a king, so therefore he's a false messiah. So now, Christians, by proving that Jesus resurrected from the dead, will be proving that God is still with him, despite the way it looks. But, of course, Christians would have to prove that, and hence the important concept of the burden of proof. Running out of time, but let me go through very quickly and mention a few points. Uh, I'll skip past this uh, because I basically explained this, the Quranic position. I want to say something about the evolution of the Christian texts uh, and, and beliefs. Uh, there's an important book written in the field called The Evolution of the Word um, by Marcus Borg, the late Marcus Borg. And, and he showed how, as we go from one gospel to another, the story about Jesus changes. And I think this is a very important thing that we have to look at tonight. So we have four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and, and John. And uh, it is generally understood, uh, even by what uh, John uh, presented, John Torres presented, John is the last of the four Gospels. Not only is the last of the four Gospels, but John is a different Gospel. And the other three are very similar. They're called synoptic Gospels. We'll come back to this and explain in more detail, but I'll go through quickly. Now, uh, scholars believe that uh, Mark was the first of the four Gospels, and that Matthew and Luke were dependent on Mark, they actually are, in a way, rewriting Mark and expanding the story and make it, making it more Christian as we go. And uh, if these are dates that are commonly accepted. 
uh, in the scholarly world, but uh, John Torres has presented uh, dates that are uh, uh, held by only a few scholars nowadays, uh, very conservative, fundamentalist, uh, liberalist uh, scholars. I don't say these uh, to demean the, uh, the, the scholars, but I'm just, just to identify so you, know, you understand. Most academics uh, would say that this, uh, these are the dates. And, and John written about by the close of the first century, around 100. And we can see that as we go from Mark, the earliest, to John, the latest, uh, the, the proof that Jesus rose from the dead is greater. The proof that he actually died is greater, including that spear thrust, which is mentioned only in John's gospel. Remember John Torres was making a big point about the spear thrust, which would have proved that Jesus died. That's only in John's gospel in the last of them. So as we go from the first to the last, the number of witnesses who are there increases so to the extent that in John's gospel, we have a witness right on the, at the cross itself. And that's the very witness who is, is apparently is claiming to be writing this last gospel. Whereas in the other Gospels, the uh, disciples forsook Jesus and fled. But in John's Gospel, this faithful disciple is right there. In fact, in modern times, scholars question whether that disciple actually existed. Uh, the one who is called the beloved disciple in the fourth Gospel does not seem to be mentioned in the other Gospels. And it, uh, Andrew Lincoln, in his commentary on, Mark, uh, on, on John's Gospel, uh, does raise this point that it looks like this is a literary device that the writer of the fourth Gospel is uh, using. He is writing about a fictitious disciple that is called an ideal or beloved disciple to show Christians this is how you're supposed to be. Not that this was an actual uh, factual person who existed and lived and walked and heard what Jesus uh, preached. Much more needs to be said about this, uh, but uh, I, I want to bring it to a quick close. Uh, and in closing, I want to recap uh, where we have gone with this uh, opening presentation. So first I have shown that uh, Muslims and Christians have to work together at this. I do not come at this from the point of view of let's uh, uh, disprove Christianity and prove Islam to be right. I come at this from the point of view that we Muslims and Christians together have to understand our faith better and present it in a way uh, that it will be understandable and respected by our youth first, and that we can present to the world at large. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Dr. Shabir. At this time, we will be uh, collecting your questions. We will also be taking a break, a 15-minute break. So in 15 minutes from now, we will be reconvening here, and then we will be hearing John give his first response, followed by Dr. Shabir's uh, first response to John's presentation as well. Uh, as there will be someone coming to each aisle to collect your questions, so be sure to provide that to one of your, the organizational representatives this afternoon. We will be returned here in 15 minutes. Again, washrooms are out the main entrance to the right. If you're looking for snacks, you would like to look at some of the booths, that will be on the hallway to the left. Thank you. Paul, that should be over 10 minutes. You're good to go? All right, at this time, we'd like to call everyone back in to the auditorium as we prepare for the next section of this uh, debate or uh, dialogue. We'll just give a couple of seconds as people begin to trickle back in. We've been receiving the questions and we've been going through them. Just an update that we would just like to let you know that the questions that have been coming, some have been very good questions, others have written page long essays. Unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, we cannot ask those questions. Those are essays and if you'd like, you could submit them to the speaker at a later time. Uh, but if you're going to be writing a new set of questions, we will make sure that we will be collecting those questions uh, at the door in our second break after the concluding statements by both speakers. We just ask, please keep your questions short. So if you happen to have been one of those persons who wrote a full essay, rephrase your question in a much shorter format, we do ask. Thank you for that. At this time, I'd like to uh, call up uh, John Tours to provide his first response. He will have 10 minutes, and then Shabir will follow afterwards. I will introduce him from my table at the, bottom, at, at the front uh, aisle, uh, and then he will also have 10 minutes. So, John.
Five page. All right. Uh, that uh, response from Dr. Ali was, was quite interesting. I appreciate what he's saying at the beginning that uh, we need to have good understanding uh, and better understanding of each other. And there, there's certainly a point there. Okay? We do need to understand what it is that we believe, why we believe it, and how to respond to other viewpoints. And I have seen uh, from both sides an awful lot of uh, lack of un proper understanding, which does hinder talk together. However, I would say there is a reason that we're doing this. There's a reason we talk with each other. Uh, we believe what we believe. I believe Christianity is true. Uh, Shabir believes Islam is true. Now, the Bible says very clearly that Jesus came as the savior of the world. Jesus himself says in that very well-known passage, John 3.16, but we'll continue on to John 3.18. Uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. Uh, Christianity teaches that Jesus is the one way to salvation. Uh, and if you read the Quran, you are familiar with what the Quran says about unbelievers and particularly those who commit the sin of shirk of which Christians are accused because we worship Jesus uh, as the second person of the triune Godhead. So it's not just a matter of understanding. I believe that people need Jesus to be saved and therefore I will try to convince them of the truth of Christianity. Uh, Shabir, if he believes that there, there's a very nasty future waiting for me if I don't believe in Islam, I would hope that he would try to convince me of it. Uh, so that is, I think, ultimately why we are both engaged in dialogue and, yes, in debate. Uh, second, uh, Shabir made the point that the Quran is open to different interpretations, and he has a doctorate in Quranic exegesis. Uh, I'm not going to argue with him on that point. I, I, I will accept. That is, is completely right. Uh, this particular uh, ayah from uh, uh, Surah 4, 157, it's a little strange where it says they did not kill him nor did they crucify him. And Shabir is telling us what, what it means is that they didn't kill him by crucifying, which would make the verse say, well, they didn't kill him nor did they kill him by crucifying him. Seems a little redundant, but sure, let's accept that. It, it can mean that. The New Testament, though, is not open to interpretation on these issues of who Jesus was and what he did, that he died on the cross, that he rose from the dead, and that he is declared to be the Son of God on that basis. Okay? That is clear, and I think uh, in my opening presentation, I, I spent quite a bit of time to establish that fact. So whether the Quran is open to interpretation on this or not, uh, the New Testament isn't. Uh, the idea that Jesus was taken up, yeah, it'll come up repeatedly, that, that he was taken up, sometimes they use the word translated, assumed into heaven. Uh, well, that's true, he was. Okay, you can read about that in, uh, at the end of Matthew. You can read about the end of Mark. You can read about in the early chapters of Acts. He was taken up after he had risen from the dead and after he had spent 40 years, uh, sorry, 40 days with his followers convincing them giving many infallible proofs had risen after that was when he was taken up. Uh, regarding this discussion about who was to blame for the death of Jesus, whether it was the Jews or the Romans, indeed, the Romans committed the act of killing, but the Romans didn't care one way or the other about Jesus. Okay? They, they had no reason to go after him. For sure, it was those, not all the Jews, of course, all his followers were Jewish, but those Jewish leaders who oppose him, they were the ones who orchestrated his death. They are the ones who did, in fact, twist Pilate's arm. Okay? Pilate uh, probably wasn't a very nice fellow, and he probably wouldn't have minded killing an innocent person. But Pilate was in a difficult situation. The job of the Roman governor was to keep peace so that tax money keeps flowing to Rome uh, with no need to expend blood and treasure putting down insurrections. That was his chief role. 
And through his time, from the very time he came uh, to, uh, in AD 26, he had teed off the Jews three times and almost started rebellion. So at this point, he is on tenterhooks. He's on short leash, and he doesn't know what should he do. These fellows are bringing Jesus to him, bringing accusations against him. He doesn't know. If I put him to death, will that start the insurrection? Or if I let him go, will that start the insurrection? The reason he ends up doing it is yes, because his arm was twisted. The Jewish leaders actually said, you know, we're, you're not Caesar's friend. They're implying they're going over his head. So there's absolutely nothing untoward or unhistorical about the, the events the way they're described in the New Testament. Uh, I was a little surprised at this appeal to, to Meverech, who who's a, uh, an ecumenist who's writing in the Huffington Post. That's where that, that story came from. It didn't come from like some serious journal, but from a left-wing, uh, uh, let's call it a newspaper. Uh, and what was said wasn't actually true. I've read Bar Sanhedrin 43. It doesn't say what Meverex says. Okay? It says that, that uh, the accusation went forth that he was committing sorcery, which, by the way, is a tacit admission that he did miracles. Uh, that he was committing these acts by sorcery, and a herald went forth for 40 days saying he's going to be hanged, and uh, no, he's going forth to be stoned. That's what it says. He's going to be stoned, and in 40 days nobody stood up for him, so after that he was hanged. There was none of this stuff about how, oh, if he'd spoken up, then we wouldn't have, uh, we wouldn't have killed him, and so on. None of that's in there. Uh, in point of fact, they were going to stone him, which is the Jewish form of execution, but they wanted to force the Romans to do it. And that's why he ends up getting hanged. Uh, next point uh, about the Davidic Messiah. That's not quite accurate either. In fact, the Old Testament prophecies have different pictures of the Messiah. There's some that indeed present him as the Davidic king, the conquering king. But there are other ones, like Isaiah 53, for example, uh, that present him as a suffering servant who dies on behalf of the people. And the Jewish people didn't actually know what to make of these different pictures. One of the answers they came up with was that there would be two messiahs. They called one of them Messiah, son of Joseph. He'd be the suffering servant. And the other one would be Messiah, son of David, the conquering king. Okay? Good guess, but wrong answer. In fact, there was one messiah who came twice, not two messiahs who each came once. Okay? Jesus comes twice, first time as the suffering servant to save the world, second time he will come as the conquering king. Now it should be noted that in Daniel chapter 9, there's a prophecy uh, about the Messiah. It says, uh, after 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end of it shall be with a cataclysm. Well, we know when that happened, that was A.D. 70. So we're told the Messiah will come before A.D. 70 and will die on behalf of the people. So here's our question, if it wasn't Jesus, who was it? There's really no other uh, candidate. Uh, burden of proof, indeed we have the burden of proof. And that's what I was doing in the opening talk, giving you the proof. Eyewitness testimony and why it's reliable, that's, that's exactly called meeting the burden of proof. And do understand, folks, the 50% plus one principle I don't have to prove to you 100% that Jesus is true. I don't have to prove to you 90%, 80%. The instant I've proven it to 50% plus one, the chances that you will die in your sins are greater than that you won't. Okay? So you have to take this evidence seriously. At the end, unfortunately, we, we did see Shabir do what I warned against. Scholars say this, scholars say, I actually brought up Marcus Borg's book. Borg was one of the ones that I quote who tells you, well, we just assumed this. I gave hard evidence. These scholars, these claims about John rewriting and, and the, uh, the picture growing, there was not a shred of evidence given. The evidence I gave showed that, in fact, John was an eyewitness. He was writing down what he said and that the picture was not growing. It was an accurate picture, but an accurate picture written to unbelievers as an evangelistic tract so that they would believe. This is why it was different. That's what I pointed out. There was not a piece of evidence given to counter that. There was not a piece of evidence given to back up this claim that the beloved disciple was a fictitious character. It was very much like the spear thrust, as I showed you from the Oxford commentary. Uh, yes, liberals say that, but they, it's pure hypothesis. They have no reason or basis for saying it. Okay? They're making stuff up. Please do not let your eternal destiny go awry 
Because people say things and they're not giving you evidence. You always need to know, how do you know? What's your evidence? What are you leaving out? That's what you need to be asking. And when you do that, you will find that Jesus Christ is true. He did rise from the dead and he is the son of God declared to be so with power from the resurrection from the dead. Thank you. Hello again, folks. Uh, I hope uh, that you have had a refreshing break. I certainly had one, and uh, we're ready to go again. And uh, uh, John has started us off nicely. Uh, thank you, John, for that engaging discussion. And I'm trying to set my own timer, but I'll rely on my friend here uh, showing me the time. So uh, let me respond to some of the things that uh, John has presented before us. Uh, one is that he has uh, diminished uh, the worth of Ian Maverick by saying that this is a writer for the Huntington Post. Uh, but actually, as you will recall from my previous presentation, I cited his article from the Journal of Religion and Society. And I happen to have the article with me here from the Journal of Religion and Society. I don't know if you can see it from where you are. Are, but you're welcome to come and take a look. I'll show it to John. John, does it say Journal of Religion and Society? Uh, up here. What's the title? Uh, Journal of Religion and Society. Of Society, yes. And uh, you can see that the article is the Quran and the Crucifixion by Ian Mevrat Emanuel College. Do you verify? Yep. Yes. Emmanuel College, folks, is at the University of Toronto. Ian Maverick is a, is a known scholar, and regardless of whatever else you might think about him, uh, I was citing a good and valid scholarly source. Uh, John says there's nothing like that in the Talmud that they said that if anyone has anything to say in his favor or anything like that, to come forward. But it actually says here, and here uh, Maverick is citing from, from the Gemara uh, of the Babylonian Talmud. It says uh, that th th this is what they said. A herald goes before him, uh, before him, but not earlier. Uh, does not a Baraita state, Jesus of Nazareth was hanged on Passover Eve. A herald went out for 40 days uh, prior to the execution, proclaiming <clears throat> Jesus of Nazareth is to be executed by stoning for witchcraft and for leading Israel astray to idolatry. Will anyone who knows anything in his favor come forward and plead for him? They found nothing in his favor, so he was hanged on Passover Eve. So I have to hope this doesn't fall over. So I, I wish that John had just taken my word for it. But nonetheless, this is how debates go. Things are questioned, and we have a right to question. Uh, but uh, as you can see, uh, the... Uh, evidence is in my favor. As with Surah 4, verse 157, as sounding redundant if we say that uh, he was hung on the cross but not actually dead on the cross, this is one of the reasons why the classical commentators did not favor that view. However, on the understanding that the Quran was actually answering both claims, one, the Jewish claim that they stoned Jesus, and the Christian claim that the Jews crucified Jesus, well then, the Quran is saying it both ways. They did not, the Jews did not kill Jesus, meaning by their methods of execution. Neither did they, in case you were wondering, uh, crucify him. Because in any case, crucifixion is not their method of execution. And uh, even if Jesus was crucified uh, by being hung on the cross, he did not actually die on the cross. So to me, it's not redundant. Uh, th there are few words, and each word is packed with, with meaning, and uh, it's like killing two birds with one stone. These, verse, these words from the Quran uh, are packed with so much meaning, it gives us food for thought, and when we investigate, we find, yeah, that, that what the Quran is saying is right in so many different ways. So... Um, it's interesting that John uh, uh, conceded that, yes, uh, Pilate was a brutal individual. And uh, it is, this is the starting point where historians think that uh, the, the Christian story is not quite correct. Pilate would hardly have conceded to the Jews and let them twist his arm. Rather, he would crucify a whole bunch of them if, he, you know, if, if they pushed him. Uh, so uh, he did not hesitate to kill Jews. 
uh, just as Nero did not hesitate to kill Jews and, and Jewish Christians uh, at the time. So they think that this is not historically plausible. But in any case, if you say that a pilot his arm could be twisted like this, and Pilate was reluctant, and he washed his hands of the whole affair. Now, it's under his auspices that Jesus is being crucified. Now, think about this. If he could look the other way while Jesus was being taken down from the cross alive, do you think he would have any reason to insist, yeah, we must actually kill him? No, because his arm was already twisted. He didn't want Jesus to die. In fact, now that we think about it more clearly, we realize that by the, by, by, by the end of the day, hardly anybody wanted to kill Jesus. Luke's gospel says that even the Jews went away beating their breasts. Why are they beating their breasts? This is their sign of repentance. You can imagine them saying, what have we done? So they are by this time repentant, even within the Christian story, we have people who are no longer interested in killing Jesus. Think about the centurion. Uh, he is, by definition, the head of a hundred soldiers. And it is said that when he saw the way in which Jesus expired, and this is literally what Mark says, that Jesus expired. Now, when he saw the way Jesus expired, Luke says that the centurion declared, this man was innocent. In Mark's gospel, this man was the son of God. Well then, if he, that's his belief at this time, uh, can you trust the centurion to ensure that Jesus is dead? Or are you more hopeful that the centurion may find a way to excuse Jesus and let him go away alive? You notice that earlier, John, in, in his first presentation, in, declare, in, in detailing for us how a person dies by crucifixion, by going up and down and up and down, he actually said, and I noted down his words, that this could actually last for days. But according to the gospel accounts, Jesus, if he was going up and down, he was only doing that for a few hours. Of course, that, that, that's terrible. It's even, uh, you know, hard to contemplate and to think about somebody going through this torturous ordeal. But if we're asking, what proof do you have that Jesus actually died on the cross, as opposed to just simply expiring and going into a coma, then the proof is not there. It would have been there in the spear thrust, but as I mentioned earlier, historians do not consider that to be authoritative and authentic. They think that that is not a historical reminiscence. That's an invention by the writer of the fourth gospel who wanted to prove now that Jesus actually died. You have to think about this scene. Here it is. Uh, Christians are talking to each other and they're talking to um, non-Christians. And the Christian says, well, Jesus uh, rose from the dead. And the non-Christian says, uh, really? How do you know he was really dead? And the Christian thinks about it. And eventually John writes about it and, and puts in this detail so that nobody can ask this question anymore. If you want to know how he died, well, he died by the spear thrust. But if Jesus had died by that spear thrust, you would expect that that would be mentioned in all of the Gospels, or at least in another Gospel. But it's not mentioned anywhere else. And when John alone mentions something, uh, and, and the other Gospels do not, that is held questionable. It may be true. Uh, but, but one cannot take it automatically as being true. Generally, historians think that the synoptic gospels are more true to the history, and John is more a, theolog a theologizing gospel. It brings out more meaning. It makes the whole uh, description of the life and teachings of Jesus more Christian than, than the other gospels did. So this is one of the, the ways. Now, uh, John Tours mentions uh, Isaiah 53, uh, leading to the idea that there must have been two messiahs, one suffering and the other one kingly. Uh, but that's a Christian conclusion from the facts before them. Yeah, Jesus did not become king, so now let's read it back. There must have been uh, two. In fact, you can have three messiahs. You can have a king, you can have a prophet, you can have a priest. But the New Testament writers tried to make Jesus all three. The Quran, in calling Jesus the Messiah, does not specify what kind of Messiah he was. So he could have been a priest, he could have been a prophet. In, but in fact, the, nothing in the Quran suggests that he was a king. But the New Testament writings in suggesting and, and insisting that Jesus was the Davidic king have made it such that the expectation naturally was that he should have been on a throne ruling. And now the Christian answer to the critics who say, but wait a minute, he didn't rule, uh, is to say, well, when he comes back, he will rule. So uh, that is a, a kind of an apology. 
uh, but uh, it does not seem to be true to the facts. So is it true that there was an evolution of the Gospels uh, and, and the information about Jesus? Uh, John Torres is asking me for proof. And here is one such indication about that spare thrust. Second is about, as I mentioned before, the invention of a whole new character that is called the beloved disciple so that he becomes an eyewitness to the crucifixion and to the spare thrust and to the death of Jesus. So uh, if you're going to invent a whole new witness, this is really an evolution. But there's more than this. If we now leave John aside and we go to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we can see that even as you go from Mark to Matthew and Luke, the story improves and changes uh, so that it becomes again more Christian. There is greater proof that Jesus died. Uh, there is a, a greater number of witnesses who can testify to that. And, and there are more times that Jesus appears to his disciples after he comes back from the dead and so on. So thank you very much. We'll come back for more. All the best. This time we'd like to welcome John to open with this a second response. That'll be another 10 minutes. Well, folks, Meverack, uh, I found his articles in the Huffington Post, okay? He published elsewhere. That's great. The, the salient point, though, is as Shabir read out those passages, it proved what I said was true. That is, I said that the, the uh, Sanhedrin 43A said that he, was, like, he, would be, uh, <clears throat> he would be stoned. He would be stoned for witchcraft. The herald went forth for 40 days. Nobody stood up for him, and then he was hanged. In his original description, Shabir was saying, oh, they said that if he on his way to execution, they were saying that, oh, if he'd spoken up for himself, they were, there was nothing there. It wasn't there. Okay? It wasn't there. I, I don't really think he cleared up the redundancy. I don't think it's a big point. But, again, if crucifixion... He was not, he was nailed to a cross, wasn't killed by it then, and saying, well, he was not killed, nor was he killed by crucifixion. I mean, once you say not killed, that covers every type of killing. So it still looks redundant, but again, it's, it's not a big issue. Uh, in point of fact, in John 10, 17, 18, yeah, Jesus says, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of myself that I may take it up again. So yeah, Jews thought they did it. They thought they did it. They did do it. They were the effective means, but only because they were allowed to do so. Uh, now, I'm very surprised about what was said about Pilate. First, he says that Pilate, I proved, I, I, I said that Pilate was a brutal man. And then he's turning around saying, well, but Pilate would want to get him off. And he said, well, Pilate doesn't mind killing innocent people. Oh, but he thinks Jesus is innocent, so he's going to try to save him. This, this, this is not consistent, folks. He can't, he can't have it both ways. I showed, in fact, on the basis of the historical evidence, why Pilate hesitated. Pilate didn't give a care as to whether Jesus was innocent or not. He killed, as Shabir admitted, he killed innocent people happily. So he was not interested in Jesus. He was only interested in which one is not going to lead to, re to uh, an insurrection. And in point of fact, shortly after Jesus uh, died and rose, three years later, he did commit that fourth infraction. And as a result, he was recalled to Rome and disappears from the pages of history. So he was very right to be worried about what's going to happen and what he should do with Jesus. Uh, the centurion, no, in Mark, the centurion says, surely this was the son of God. He doesn't say he was innocent. And again, centurions do their job. They, they know that a lot, of, a lot of people they kill are innocent. They don't care. Okay? Uh, the idea, therefore, that there's some kind of conspiracy here where Pilate, oh, he feels so bad about killing an innocent man, he's going to get him off and the centurion's going to work with him. No, that, that doesn't fly. Uh, he was wondering about this, this, how come Jesus died so soon? You have to push yourself up for days and days. Uh, maybe I went too quickly on this. Let me try again. There are three ways you die in crucifixion. You, your heart gives out or a catastrophic heart failure. If neither of those get you, then you can stay there for days, pushing up and down, pushing up and down. Uh, obviously, Jesus died from one of these other means, presumably catastrophic heart failure. He cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last, and that's what that word means, breathed his last, which means he's dead. He's not breathing anymore. Uh, so while well, he expired, that doesn't mean he's dead. Yeah, it does. When you breathe your last, you're dead. Okay? And uh, that probably was the sign of catastrophic heart failure. That's why he died 
sooner than average, but certainly not unknown. Crucifixion killed people anywhere from a few hours up to a few days. So that this was not a historical. Uh, Pilate was surprised, indeed he was surprised, he was already dead. What did he do? He went to make sure, and he found that he was dead. So again, no mystery there. Uh, if John alone gives details, that's suspicious. Okay? But if all of them have it, that's collusion. You, just, you can't win one way or the other. If they're all there, then they just got together and planned it. If only one put it there, then, well, then he made it up by himself. Uh, the stuff about the Messiah. Okay? This is not a Christian retrodiction about Isaiah 53. If you read the rabbinic commentaries for the ancient world, that was the Jewish idea. That was the debate. Okay? The idea of a suffering servant Messiah is not just in uh, Isaiah 53. You have it in Zechariah 14. You have it in, as I read, Daniel 9. Messiah is cut off, but not for himself. Okay? So yes, that was an idea, and it was the Jews who were wondering this and thinking up this idea of two Messiahs before Jesus came. It's not something Christians made up after the fact. Uh, then... And again, this, this part is a bit disturbing to me because we went over the fact that simply having scholars say this is not proof. Okay? If you look at something like the law of universal gravitation, okay, all scholars agree. It doesn't matter if you're a Christian, a Muslim, a Buddhist, a Hindu, an atheist, secularist, liberal, conservative. Everybody agrees that the force of attraction of two masses is G equals, uh, F equals gm1 m2 over r squared, right? Where g is 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 newtons meter squared per kilogram squared. They all agree. Why? Because they're all going by the facts. When you have a spectrum of scholarship where you can have one guy with a PhD saying g Jesus rose from the dead, and the guy, the PhD, is saying Jesus never existed. You know they are not going by facts, and this is why I said from the beginning, you have to look at the facts. Okay? I gave you hard evidence why we have to accept that these gospel writers, three of them were eyewitnesses, and that's the best historical evidence you have for anything from the ancient world. Instead, we're coming back. Historians say, historians have found. Strangely, uh, he even said historians, he goes back to saying that the spear point, historians have found that this was made up by John when I actually showed you from the Oxford commentary, the liberal Oxford commentary, that there are some who say it. It's by no means something that historians have found as if they all agree on it. And I showed you from the commentary that the, even the liberals admit this is hypothetical. They have no proof for that claim. So why would we throw out what the eyewitness says because modern-day scholars who, who tend to be atheists, secularists, don't want to accept it. Where is the evidence that John made it up? Well, who are we to say that this man, where all the evidence shows he's an eyewitness, and this is what he writes, what he saw, and we were born 2,000 years too late to be eyewitnesses ourselves, why would our testimony, our claim, unsubstantiated claim, override what the eyewitness said? Okay? Now, unfortunately, this is becoming a pattern where you keep hearing historians say, historians have found. Okay? And, and just, uh, just, just going right past the point that I made. But okay, but you guys know it now. Okay? You've seen it. You have to go by hard historical evidence when you hear a man just say, well, historians have found. Historians say, historians say they made up the beloved disciple. Historians say, that's not evidence. You have to ask, what is your evidence? What is the historian's evidence for that? When he says it's not true, what is the evidence? Well, Matthew Mark didn't mention it, so what? Does that mean it's not true? No. Okay. You can find those, those, those five accounts of Alexander the Great. You can find the four accounts of uh, Augustus. And you're going to find some things that only one historian mentioned, the others didn't. Does that mean it's not true? No. Okay. So if, when you care about your eternal destiny, you need to put us to the test. You need to ask, what is your evidence? I have given evidence. I have not simply said scholars say this, scholars say that. Okay. You have to look at the evidence. Uh, anything else on that? Uh, yeah, the story didn't get more Christian. Again, eyewitnesses are writing what they saw. Matthew and Mark are writing for Christians. This is why they've covered different uh, topics. I showed one time in a different presentation, I, I pulled out four books about uh, the Canada-Soviet hockey series from 1972. Okay? 
And I, I, I match the authors. One was Ken Dryden. He was a participant writing with Mark Mulvoy. So it's just like Mark writing Peter's testimony. Uh, Paul Henderson was like the big star of the series. Harry Sinan was a coach. A fourth guy who wasn't a participant, so he's just getting information from people. So it, it matched uh, in terms of authorship the four gospel books. And then I showed they're actually very different. You look at three of them, they cover the same territory, the same kind of stuff. One of them is different, Paul Henderson's. His was different. He, he didn't say actually that much about the series. He didn't say that much about the games. He talked about a lot of other things. Why? Because Paul Henderson had become a Christian. And Paul Henderson wrote his book because he wanted to teach this truth so that people could come to Christ. So that's why his book was different from the other three. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are different because they're written for Christians. John is written for non-Christians. Explains the difference. You cannot turn around and say, well, it didn't happen. It's not historical because it's different. So please, folks, remember, you don't want to be fooled. You need to always ask those three questions. How do you know? What's your evidence? What are you leaving out? And then you need to look. What is the evidence that's given? I have given evidence. Historians have found is not evidence. Okay? So please do not be cheated out of your eternal destiny. Thank you. Dr. Shavir, you may now proceed for your second response. You also have 10 minutes. Okay, so this is my final uh, response to uh, the, the things that I've heard uh, John uh, say. And eventually we'll have a five minute conclusion in which we try to wrap uh, uh, together everything that went by because so much goes by and sometimes it's hard to keep track of where the discussion uh, went. So uh, keeping track of what uh, John and I have been talking about regarding this article from the Journal of Religion and Society by Ian Mavarak, I've had to bring it back because uh, John is still questioning whether it was even mentioned that allowance was given for the victim, uh, Jesus in this case, to uh, plead on his own behalf. And here, Mevarak has quoted from the Mishnah uh, 42b uh, in the Babylonian Talmud, where it says, even if the accused says, I have something to say in my favor, they bring him back as many as four or five times, provided there is sense in what he says. So putting this all together, what I said is correct. It uh, correctly cites the article, and uh, it shows that the Jews in their own narrative were showing that they were justified in killing Jesus in their own way by stoning, and then following the stoning by hanging. Um, whereas, of course, the Christian Gospels say that Jesus was crucified under the Roman authorities, but due to the twisting of Pilate's arm by the Jews. The Quran is saying the Jews are not responsible for this. They did not kill Jesus as they are claiming they did, and nor were they responsible for the crucifixion. And historians now agree that Pilate was a brutal man. He would not have allowed the Jews to twist his arm as uh, depicted in the Gospels. And uh, this is the Gospel writer's own way of uh, exonerating uh, the Romans and blaming the Jews. So it turns out that uh, 1400 years ago, uh, the Quran actually said something which historians are now recognizing to be true. I find that to be very interesting and uh, remarkable. As for uh, have, trying to have it both ways with Pilate, I'm not trying to have it both ways. I'm saying that the gospel depiction is not correct. But as an ecumenical issue, if you want to come together as Muslims and Christians and understand the story of Jesus in a way that we can present it to the modern youth, then it seems that we have a way here for Muslims to understand uh, that Jesus was saved by God, by God's power in some mysterious way, and for Christians to say, hey, wait a minute, our own Gospels depict Pilate in this way, so if our Gospels are true even to this extent, it seems that it leaves a leeway for Jesus to escape alive from the cross. So it looks like the Muslims have a point there. So that's the only thing I'm trying to say. I'm not saying that Pilate was like this or that Pilate did actually see to the escape of Jesus. I'm saying that Christians, given what is written in their Gospels, must admit that this is a viable possibility. Now, 
John Tor says, well, it says that Jesus breathed his last. And uh, uh, that would mean that he died. Normally, yes. But if we have a scenario where a person gets his last breath in this life at a certain time in history, whereas God has taken him up into heaven, we can say the same thing about Enoch. Enoch walked with God and then God took him and he was no more. So he had his last breath on earth, but he is still alive in heaven. Elijah was taken up in a whirlwind, still alive in heaven, according to the Christian Bible. So he had his last breath on earth. So if Jesus had his last breath for that moment here on on earth uh, on the cross and then God took him up to himself I don't find that to be a proof that he actually died now uh, J John says well wait a minute if they uh, disagree we show look there's a disagreement and then if they agree we say no there is collusion I, I don't think we're anybody saying that there is collusion uh, but uh, of course if if the writings are so close to each other then we would say that one copied from another this is what we do in any uh, university or high school setting we get essays and we evaluate them and students Students may want to copy from each other, so uh, we have to be aware of that. Uh, but we allow for certain differences. But if there is something that should have been said, had it occurred, and, and nobody says it, and then somebody suddenly says it, well then this becomes a problem, and look what happens. Paul, in, in his uh, letter to the Corinthians, speaks about the death and burial of Jesus and his subsequent reappearance to his disciples. He says nothing about the tomb of Jesus being discovered empty. So that is something that should have been said. Now historians are looking at this and they say that Mark actually invented the idea of the empty tomb and that the women went to the tomb and discovered it empty. And they think that if it was actually uh, discovered empty, uh, soon after the crucifixion event, everybody would have known about it and Paul would have written about it as part of his proof, which is given very elaborately. He's giving a very elaborate proof that Jesus rose from the dead and appeared to his disciples. This would have been a good addition. The fact that he didn't mention it when it should have been mentioned is a proof that it, well, not a absolute proof, but it is an indication that it did not occur. Moreover, when we look at the Gospels together, we see that there is a development. Mark's Gospel ends uh, with chapter 16, verse number 8, in some of the most reliable manuscripts, such as Codex Vaticanus and uh, Sinaiticus. Scholars then generally take this to be uh, the uh, way in which Mark himself ended his gospel. Now, there are other theories. Some people say, well, maybe he wrote more, but it was lost. Some say he, it was actually deliberately torn off, according to the uh, interpreter's one-volume commentary on the Bible. And each one of these positions gives rise to different theories and possibilities. But most scholars hold that Mark ends with chapter 16, verse number 8, where the women uh, fled from the tomb and said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Now the question arises from this, if they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid, how did Mark even know about this story? And the answer from historians is that uh, what this indicates is that Mark is making the first step towards declaring this story. And his excuse for the fact that people don't know this story is to say, well, uh, the, the women saw, but, but they didn't say anything to anybody. That's why nobody knows about it. And then Matthew and Luke will pick up upon this, and Matthew and Luke will elaborate and show that the women actually did run to go and tell the disciples. Both Matthew and Luke do this. Because that's how the story continues. The women go to tell the disciples, and eventually Jesus appears to the women, Jesus appears to the disciples, and so on. But not in Mark, the earliest of the four Gospels. So we can see here, definitely there is a development in, in the story. Now, John mentioned Isaiah 53 again, and so I must come back to it. If we look at, clearly at Isaiah 53, which Christians use as a proof that Jesus is the Messiah, this story about the suffering person shows that this person will actually be rescued and not die because he will live on to see his children. Jesus, of course, didn't have any children, but even if you say this appeal, uh, applied to Jesus in some way, let's say that the people of the church are the children of Jesus, well, uh, this actually is showing that he didn't die. In fact, commentators had thought that this passage referred to Hezekiah, a Jewish king, who was given a new lease of, on life until he, he had a son. 
So uh, this passage uh, used as a reference to Jesus is a further indication that Jesus did not actually die when Christians thought that he died. And we can go on about other passages which are cited in Acts of the Apostles. For example, Peter, speaking to the, uh, to the public, uh, says that Jesus was uh, spoken about in uh, in the Psalms, Psalms chapter 16. When we go to Psalms chapter 16, we see, according to the interpreter's one volume commentary on the Bible, that this was not about a person dying. This was about a person getting close to death and being rescued by God, by God from dying. So uh, this again shows that the idea that Jesus died is not actually uh, quite correct, even if we look at the details in the Gospels. Although the writers are saying that Jesus died, nevertheless, there are clues indicating that he didn't die. When Peter again uh, spoke, and they said that the, uh, the, the, the capstone, uh, the, the, the stone that the builders rejected, this becomes the capstone. And a saying like that is attributed to Jesus in the Gospels as well. Well, we go to Psalm 118 where this is spoken about. And clearly there in the verses preceding this one in Psalm 118, it speaks about a person who will be saved by God from dying so that he would not die. And this again indicates that Jesus did not actually die uh, on the cross. Finally, why is John's gospel different? I don't believe that it is different only for the reason which John Tors mentioned. Maybe that's one of the reasons. But I have shown how John improves upon the story, makes it more Christian, uh, proves more than the others that uh, Jesus died on the cross and that he resurrected from the dead and reappeared to his, disciple, uh, to his disciples by giving evidence which... Had it existed in fact, should have been mentioned by the others. The fact that this was not mentioned by the others is an indication that this is an invention by the fourth gospel and therefore not believable. And in the end, I rest my case that Jesus uh, did not die on the cross. God rescued him Time. and raised him to himself. Thank you very much. At this time, we'd like to invite John to step forward for his concluding statement. You will have five minutes. The empty tomb should have been mentioned by Paul. The empty tomb didn't convince anybody, not the disciples, not anybody. There's no reason to mention it. Isaiah 53, it didn't actually say this person died. Let's see. Uh, he was led as a lamb to the slaughter. He was taken from prison. He was cut off from the land of the living. They made his grave with the wicked. Of course, Isaiah 53 says Jesus died. Uh, let's move on. To our closing statement, when Jesus was nailed to the cross, the chief priests and elders thought they had won. They exposed him as a fake, they thought. They mocked him mercilessly, save yourself, come down from the cross. Himself, he cannot say, come down and then we'll believe you. Third day following, after Jesus had risen, the guards from the tomb came to inform the chief priest, that man you thought you'd gotten rid of, he's back. He did save himself. What do you think a reasonable person should do at this point? He should admit he was wrong, apologize to Jesus, follow him. Is that what they did? No. They bought and paid for a lie. Yeah, it's a pretty clumsy lie, but that's what they did. They're faced with the irrefutable evidence. They choose to believe the lie anyway. Now, the reason we're asking this, bringing this up, it is relevant because today we have presented irrefutable evidence from eyewitness testimony that Jesus rose from the dead. Speculative, fanciful assumptions and presuppositions from historians 20 centuries later don't change that fact. We showed that the gospel books are reliable eyewitness testimony published early. Jesus did miracles. He was killed by crucifixion. He rose from the dead, declared to be the Son of God. We have answered the challenges, eyewitness challenges. 
I will leave you with one more line of evidence here, folks, uh, for you to consider. And that's this one. Jesus must have risen from the dead because the apostles said he did. Yeah, that doesn't sound like much of an argument, does it? But let's see what the skeptics say. They will complain that there's no audience gathered at the tomb to see the resurrection of Jesus. Why not? Because Jesus didn't predict his death. That's what they say. Nobody recalled Jesus saying he would rise from the dead. Well, that's wrong, though. That's false. Even his enemies remember that. That's why they asked for a tomb guard. So remember while he was still alive, how that deceiver said after three days, I will rise. So why were the disciples not waiting for Jesus to come back from the dead? The problem is not that they didn't know of Jesus' predictions or forgot them, but they didn't believe them. Why didn't they believe them? Because of the presumed certainty that dead people do not return to life was such that even Jesus' own disciples did not believe that he would rise despite the fact he told them. Yeah. We saw how hard they were to convince. But that leads us to this question. Why did not the followers Buddha claim that their leader had risen bodily from the dead or been seen by eyewitnesses? Why not the followers of Mirza Ghulam Ahmad or Baullah or of Joseph Smith and Brigham Young or indeed of anybody other than Jesus? It certainly would have enhanced their status. It would have enhanced their claims if they'd come back from the dead. But in fact, the followers of religious leaders do not claim that their leaders rose from the dead, even though it would enhance their status. Only the followers of Jesus ever made such a claim. Why not others? Because the claim that a man who has been killed a short time ago has risen from the dead and been seen by many eyewitnesses is subject to instant verification. Either there really are those numerous eyewitnesses who testify that they saw the risen man after his death, and they testify to this perhaps even at the cost of persecution that may be deadly, or the claim will be exposed as a fraud immediately. So no one whose leader did not rise from the dead will claim that he did. The fraudulent nature of the claim would be immediately exposed and the movement would be immediately discredited. The only ones who would dare to make such a claim are those whose leader actually did rise from the dead and who have the eyewitnesses to back it up. Okay? And the only ones who did such a thing throughout history are the followers of Jesus Christ. And the fact that they are the only ones is in fact a powerful argument that he did so. They would not have dared to make that claim otherwise they would have discredited themselves and so uh, we have to ask ourselves, what you're going to do at this point? Okay. While they were going, behold, some of the guards came to the city report, chief priests. We saw what the chief priests and elders did. Okay. They had their worldview. They didn't want it to be upset. Now they're faced with evidence that they're wrong. Are you going to be like them? Are you going to hold on to your worldview and ignore the evidence? Or are you going to go where the evidence leads? Are you going to ignore the fact that this was eyewitness testimony? Four different accounts, the absolute best documentation I have for anything from ancient history. Are you going to accept that or are you going to turn to Historians and scholars who make speculations, who offer no proof, trust me, I have a PhD, just accept it. Okay? Because understand, once again, your eternal destiny depends on making the right choice. So please think about it carefully. Uh, since Shabir gets the last word, he'll bring up things that I will not have time to answer. Uh, we have a follow-up uh, seminar to this debate next week, and it was interested. Any of your questions that don't get answered, please feel free to send them into our ministry. Uh, there are answers. Uh, we will post them on our website. So th once again, thank you for coming, and I hope we've given you something uh, valuable that you will think about seriously. Thank you. This time, we'd like to invite Shabir for his concluding statement. You will also have five minutes. So in my conclusion, folks, uh, I, I would like to m mention something that I promised to deal with but didn't. Uh, that is the, the reference uh, in, in Paul's writing that Jesus appeared to 500 uh, persons at once. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, a book to you. 
It is uh, entitled The Resurrection, A Critical Inquiry by Michael Alter. He has dealt with uh, many uh, important aspects of this question, uh, but, but also the one at hand about Paul's uh, statement about the 500. And what he shows is that uh, uh, the, 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 uh, Corinth was halfway uh, around the Mediterranean from, from Jerusalem. So you don't expect that somebody getting a letter in Corinth will say, okay, who, or let's go find the remaining 250 or so persons of the 500 who are still alive who saw Jesus, and let's verify the story. Uh, you would have to, if you travel by sea, you would deal with shipwrecks. Paul himself had three different shipwrecks in his life on separate occasions. You probably have to deal with the pirates of the Mediterranean. Uh, and if you travel by road, it's a longer way around, given the transportation methods in those days. And since Paul does not name his witnesses, it, it's hard for anyone to think about, okay, who, who am I going to find, where am I going to find him? He doesn't even say where they are whether they are in Jerusalem or somewhere else. So that is hardly uh, a, a very uh, strong claim to say, well, because Paul said he appeared to 500. Uh, was Paul trustworthy? This is another question. In Acts of the Apostles, Paul does not actually appear uh, to be entirely trustworthy. Think about when he says he didn't realize uh, that the high priest was the high priest. Like, uh, why didn't he know that this is the high priest? Or when he was under trial and he said that the only reason I'm under trial is because of my belief in the resurrection. Uh, whereas that was not the point of contention. It was whether or not he was desecrating the, the Jewish temple. Um, so can we take Paul's word for it just because he said? Wedderburn, in his book on the resurrection, says that Paul's own claim that he saw Jesus uh, may not have been actually accepted by the disciples of Jesus. And you see in Acts of the Apostles that the disciples of Jesus uh, are said to be afraid of Paul. Why would they be afraid of him if they already have the Holy Spirit, which Jesus breathed upon them, and now Paul has the Holy Spirit, which uh, is conferred upon him by, his vir by virtue of him seeing Jesus. Uh, uh, now, why would those who have the Holy Spirit be afraid of the one who has the Holy Spirit? Uh, the answer is that they were not quite sure that he could be uh, trusted to be one of them. Eventually, they did accept him, of course. Isaiah 53 does speak about uh, this uh, suffering servant having his grave with the wicked. Uh, but that doesn't prove that Jesus died, because if Jesus was the suffering servant, I'm not denying that he was entombed, but I'm only saying that when he was entombed, he could have been alive at that time. And then God translated him uh, into uh, heaven uh, while he was still alive, so he didn't die. Uh, what about the guards at the tomb that would have ensured that uh, no... no um, uh, horseplay could have uh, transpired. Well, this uh, is said to be an invention by Matthew. Remember we said Mark is the first, Matthew and Luke following from Mark, and then Matthew and Luke uh, aggrandizing the story. Well, this is one of the aggrandizements, aggrandizements that uh, Matthew introduces here, the guards. If you go back to Mark's gospel, the, nobody is aware that there are guards at the tomb. And nobody else in any other gospel is aware that there are guards at, at the tomb. And even even the story does not uh, quite give you confidence because, as uh, Dr. William Lane Craig pointed out, the tomb was not guarded on the Friday night, so the body could have been moved on the Friday night. Uh, I thought I heard John uh, Torres say that uh, uh, the centurion did not say uh, that Jesus was innocent. I must have misheard him, but just in case, uh, Luke chapter 24, verse number 47 has it that the centurion says, truly this man was innocent. What about the idea that the disciples would not have invented this, and they even died while proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus. Well, not all of the disciples died while proclaiming this. In fact, one will be hard-pressed to show that Bartholomew or Matthias or uh, even Matthew, the writer of the gospel. And what about John, the writer of the fourth gospel? Uh, one would be hard-pressed to show that these persons were martyrs for the faith. And so one cannot generalize and say that all of the persons who proclaimed this died for their faith, and therefore they must be sincere, and therefore we should trust them, and Jesus really resurrected from the dead. In the end, we don't really have proof that Jesus resurrected from the dead. We have the uh, testimony of some people, uh, uh, but we have seen that that has to be regarded uh, in the way that we uh, describe. So I'll leave you with these thoughts, and I, am, I will be open to your uh, questions. Thank you so much.
prior to us breaking for a second time, uh, for those of you who have uh, written a new set of questions, we will be collecting them. Uh, there will, in fact, be representatives at the main entrance of the door. They will be receiving any questions you'd like to submit, and they will be mixed with the first collection, so that way there is an even distribution, and there will be questions for each. I will explain the Q&A a bit more uh, when we get to that stage. Um, after the break, before we do so, I've been asked by organizers to mention that there is a follow-up event to this debate, the Jesus Rise from the Dead. You can find more information at the Truth in My Days uh, booth out in the hallway to my left. And uh, we will be back here in 15 minutes. Again, there's a 15-minute uh, break to which we will return, and we will conclude the debate by 5 p.m. Uh, that'll be the Q&A section. All right, well, we'll see you again in 15 minutes. At right, this time, we'd like to grab everyone's attention. Feel free to take seats. If you happen to be outside of the auditorium, you can start making your way in. We will be starting our Q&A session. We will have until 5 p.m. I will explain a little bit about the Q&A format, just so that you're not caught off guard. Uh, that way you're aware as to what's taking place. There will be several questions. We will be alternating in between who the question is addressed to. We will be beginning with the question to Shabir. Now, the way it works is if a question is addressed, for example, to Dr. Shabir, uh, he will have two minutes to answer that question. Uh, at the end of that two-minute period, John has the option, if he would like to, to say something. He has one minute to either add or clarify. After that one minute, if Shabir, who the question was originally made out to, would like to respond, he will have one minute as well. Then that will be the end of it, and we will proceed to the next question addressed to the other speaker. We'd also, again, like to ask that you please keep uh, uh, your clapping or your applause to the end of the Q&A session, not just after the question. We want to make the most of our time, fit as many questions as possible. We will not be able to address every question that was uh, brought in. That There were quite a lot, and I understand Truth In My Days will be doing what they can to be able to get back to those questions in some form or manner, one of which is their follow-up event in which John Torres will be able to provide a bit more clarity for questions that were expressed to him. The first question, I will uh, announce this first question here, allow Sh uh, Shabir to answer from his table. John will also ha has a mic on his table as well, and they will be uh, looking towards me at the table there, just letting me know, yes, I'd like to proceed, I'd like to answer that question, that would be fine. I will be answering the remainder of the questions from my table at the front pew, so you don't have to see me walking up and down the stairs several times with the opportunity of potentially falling. <laughs> so, question for Shabir. You claim the four Gospels are not the word of God. What's then the Gospel that the Quran refers to? Where is it today? I, I did not claim that the four Gospels as they are are not the word of God. I would say that the Gospels uh, contain a message from God. And in that sense, it can be called uh, word of God. The Quran speaks respectfully uh, about the Christian uh, scriptures by referring to uh, the prophets and the messages that came to various prophets. And as for the Gospels, the Quran uh, refers to the singular Injil and speaks about the Injil that was given to Jesus. We can see that to a certain extent, uh, the uh, four Gospels include some statements of Jesus. To Muslims, that would be essentially what the Injil is, uh, statements of Jesus, not necessarily reports about his life and his works, but his sayings. Uh, but uh, the present form of the sayings of Jesus in the Gospels are not necessarily the way he spoke them. Uh, we can see that statements of Jesus develop from one Gospel to another. Uh, for example, pertinent to our uh, question about the resurrection uh, and the crucifixion, in the Synoptic Gospels, Jesus prays in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he says, let this, let this cup pass away from me. But in John's Gospel, uh, Jesus uh, declares in John chapter 12, uh, now the hour has come. And what should I say? Take this hour away from me or let this hour pass? No, it is for this very reason that I came. So uh, in, in the Synoptic Gospels, Jesus prays to be saved from the hour, but in John's Gospel, he declares that he will not pray like that. So which one is it? Uh, a Muslim would be unable to decide. And we can say that the Gospels do report <coughs> uh, teachings of Jesus, 
Uh, but we cannot say that 100% of what the report is actually uh, what Jesus said and taught. Is this working? Is it working? Yeah. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Are the Gospels the Word of God? Uh, the short answer is yes, they are. Uh, Christians do believe that the people who wrote the books of the New Testament, including the Gospel books uh, per Second Peter 1, 20 to 21, they were driven by the Holy Spirit. As a result, all of Scripture is God-breathed. Uh, Theopneustos, 2 Timothy 3.16. Uh, and we see that the, the entirety of your word is truth, Psalm 119, 160. And we know from John 14.26 that the gospel writers were not dependent on their own memories to write these things. Jesus guaranteed the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. He will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all things that I said to you. Uh, this obviously, its message disagrees and with the Quran, so they have to denounce it. If you look at that passage in John 12, 27 to 28, and compare it to what he said in the Garden of Gethsemane, you will find there's actually no contradiction. Jesus is troubled. He's considering Time. asking it. He won't ask. To follow up with what John was just saying, um, to me there is a contradiction I must humbly point out. Because notice the way that John said it. In John, John Torres just said that in John, Jesus is considering whether he should say that, and he decides not to say it. But in the Synoptic Gospels, he does actually say it. So you can't have it both ways. He, he decided not to say it, but he says it. Um, so it's the two different sets of Gospels representing Jesus differently. The earlier Gospels show him to be very human. The last of the four Gospels shows him to be very divine. Uh, so it, it, and, and it's in his divine role. He's not going to pray like that because if he's God who has come down here uh, to uh, uh, die for the sins of the world, why should he be asking God uh, to save him from this role. No, he came for that. Uh, and, and, of course, John does not intend that Jesus is God, but he intends him to be a divine person come Time. down on earth. This next question is for John. Could you comment on the Q source and on Mark being the first gospel, etc.? Uh, <clears throat> as we saw in my presentation, and... Uh, we went over it a little quickly. The hard historical evidence uh, all shows that Matthew was written first. Mark was second, Luke third, John was fourth. Now, the evidence that Matthew was written first is so strong that the most flaming liberal scholars, such as D.F. Strauss, uh, all admitted Matthean priority. It didn't change until the latter part of the 19th century with the discovery of two old manuscripts, rather corrupt ones, missing the last 12 verses of Mark, when liberal scholars realized that we can use this to undercut the resurrection. We need three things, though. One, we need Mark to be first. Two, we need Matthew and Luke to have copied Mark. And then three, we need to say Mark originally didn't have those last 12 verses. None of those are true. Overnight, they threw out all of that evidence from Matthew priority, Matthew being first, and proclaimed Mark as first. And then they proclaimed Matthew and Luke copied from Mark, which also is against the historical evidence. Uh, then they had to come up with this idea of, well, what about the stuff that's in Matthew and Luke but not in Mark? They must have copied that from another source. So out of their imagination, they created this cue uh, There's been no manuscripts found of Q, no quotations from Q, no mentions, although the early... Uh, Christian writers talk a lot about how the Gospels were in no mention of this. So it remains nothing but a figment of uh, liberal scholars' imagination. Uh, the idea that Mark was first was essentially an example of what's called the Texas sharpshooter fallacy, where you show what a good shot you are by shooting a bullet in the tree and then painting the target around it after. The Gospel books were rearranged, the order, in order to try to create this illusion that the story of Jesus was growing. Uh, John uh, paints liberal scholars as though like they're Satans out there trying to disprove the resurrection of Jesus. But that's not really true. Um, 
it, it may be true for some individual. I mean, not that they're Satans, but it, it may be that some individuals proceed like that. But we find that, by and large, uh, there are Christian scholars who are trained in traditional Christian settings. They're trained to defend and represent the gospel. And eventually they realize that what they've been taught traditionally is not true. As they investigate further, they realize that there is another picture um, and a different way in which things fit together. Uh, earlier, uh, John referred to Gord Ludeman. Gord Ludeman is a trained New Testament scholar, and uh, later on he uh, reneged on the faith. And uh, you know of Bart Ehrman, of course. He's trained as well. Uh, uh, John Torres mentioned uh, Robert Funk. Uh, these are all trained New Testament scholars. They study it in Greek, and these are their conclusions. It's not that they're out to disprove Christianity. Eventually, they come to the conclusion that what they've been taught is false. Yeah, the question, once again, folks, as I keep hammering, what is the basis for that conclusion? We saw Funk's basis. We assume it. We saw Ludeman's basis. We presuppose it. The fact that matters is what does the evidence say? The evidence says that Matthew was first. The evidence is so overwhelming that, as I said, the most flaming liberal scholars, Satan's or not, didn't deny it. So did new evidence pop up in the latter part of the 19th century to overturn that? No. What popped up were two corrupt manuscripts that gave them the uh, chance to undercut the resurrection, but they needed to have Mark come first, and overnight, Mark and party was born. Like, this is fact of history. You can go look at it. There may be two scholars in all of history before the late 19th century who promoted Mark and priority. And they were shot down by their fellow scholars because that is not what the evidence says. Please, folks, look at the evidence. Go by the evidence. Do not be fooled by the term scholar. Next question is for Shabir. The Talmud was compiled 430 years after the New Testament in Babylon. So how is it relevant in our discussion? It's relevant because the, uh, the, the Talmud, uh, yes, compiled later on, uh, represents the Jews as being uh, justified in, in their claim that they killed Jesus. Uh, so this is their story. They have a counter-narrative to the Christian New Testament. Their narrative is not authentic and, and not considered historically reliable, uh, and, and that's not how I presented it or Ian Meverack pre presented it. What Ian Meverack is saying, and I concur with, is that the Jews developed their own narrative to justify their own claim that they killed Jesus and to show themselves as being righteous in doing so. Uh, that's a counter-narrative to what is there in the Christian Gospels. But the Quran is responding to that Jewish Talmud and responding to the Jews in the time of the Prophet Muhammad and whom be peace who were boasting, we killed the Messiah, this so-called Messiah, uh, Jesus, son of, of Mary. And the Quran is saying, no, they didn't. Uh, they, they didn't kill. So it appeared to them like that. To the Jews in the time of the Prophet Muhammad, it must have appeared, given what is written in the Talmud, that they, as a Jewish nation, are responsible for the death of Jesus. But the Quran is saying, no, they didn't kill him. And in case somebody might say, well, wait a minute, the Christian Gospels show that they crucified Jesus, so they, they, they at least crucified him. The Quran is saying, no, they didn't do that either. They didn't crucify him. So this is how it becomes relevant to our discussion, to understand the Quranic passage, uh, whereas uh, traditional commentaries on the Quran had declared that the Quran denies that Jesus was put on the cross, now we have a new angle to recognize that the Quran is not denying that Jesus was put on the cross, it is only denying the Jewish narrative which is there in the Talmud, and by extension also the Christian narrative which blames the Jews for the death of Jesus. So basically what you have in the New Testament is eyewitnesses telling us what happened. 400 years later, people are born 400 years too late to have any kind of uh, knowledge of the facts, make up a story, supposedly, to absolve themselves of guilt, which the New Testament doesn't actually ascribe to them. Uh, there was something a little bit funny there because... Uh, Bar Sanhedrin 43, as I said, doesn't say the things that were claimed. And then they had to roll in Mishnah 42, which isn't even about Jesus. So uh, 
maybe they try to make up this narrative, but it's a narrative made up out of whole cloth 400 years later. It therefore has no credibility. Uh, the Quran's account comes another 200 or so years later. Neither of them can override what the eyewitnesses had to say. And this is what they said. Um, John has spoken a lot about eyewitnesses, and uh, we must be aware that uh, eyewitnesses uh, are not automatically taken for what they, they, they say. Uh, you know, eyewitnesses sometimes uh, have their own agenda and, and their own reasons for saying what they're saying. So we have to look at the facts. Yes, eyewitness testimony is one of the considerations in trying to determine what is the fact of what happened, but, but it doesn't end there with eyewitness testimony. As I've demonstrated, uh, according to what historians uh, find, the New Testament writers uh, were saying something which uh, is not actually true. Think of uh, uh, Peter and, and, and Paul praising the Roman authorities as instruments of God who enact justice on behalf of God. These are the authorities who, according to the New Testament, just crucified Jesus. Where was the justice in what they were doing to Jesus? So how could they write like that? They're writing like that because that is the bias from which they're writing. They want to placate the Roman authorities. And so they blame the Jews for the death of Jesus and they exonerate the Romans. The Quran comes and says, no, the Jews are not to be blamed for that. The Quran turns out to be right from a historical point of view. Time. Next question is for John. In the Gospel of John, the reference here is John chapter 21, verse 24. The authors, plural, say a beloved disciple wrote this down and they use it to write their gospel. How can John be the author when the text denies it? The text doesn't deny it. Okay? The text speaks of the author in the third person. But that, in fact, was a very standard uh, literary style of the ancient world. Uh, you, Tacitus, who considered the greatest of Roman historians, uh, he wrote anonymously. Um, but Herodotus, the famous historian Herodotus, when he started writing his book, he wrote of himself in the third person. He introduced himself in the third person, speaking of him as if he were someone else. Uh, that was picked up then by Thucydides, another very well-known uh, Greek historian, and because these two uh, historians took that style, many later historians use that style as well. Uh, Xenophon did it, uh, even Josephus in one of his books. So when you see that John is written in the third person, that says nothing to, to speak against the idea that John wrote it. It was simply the style, one of the styles popular in those days for writing history. Uh, the fact that John did write it is well documented by so many people in a position to know, as I uh, mentioned before, Irenaeus was a student of Polycarp, who was himself a student of the Apostle John. Uh, the evidence for Johannine authorship of this book is really beyond uh, reproach. Claims like, well, you know, they, they, things don't look right, they're trying to uh, placate the Roman authorities. They really aren't. Those passages are talking about what is the proper role of authorities. It doesn't even specifically mention the Romans. Uh, and the uh, passages about uh, the Jews, they did not said to kill. Okay? There were some others who were on his side. And John was in a position to see this. He know, wrote it, and he tells us he wrote it. They were speaking about the Roman authorities because those were the authorities at the time. They didn't need to be named, but they're the ones who carried the sword, and there's New Testament writers are saying that they are using the sword on behalf of God. So they killed Jesus. Well, where was the justice in that? They were placating the Romans and trying to exonerate the Romans and blame the Jews. As for the ending of John's Gospel, uh, if we know the author, and we can see that the author is using like reference to himself in the third person, then it's not a problem because that's the author's style. But if we don't know the author and we pick up a book and we see that this author is referring uh, to uh, a, a person in the third person, then we know that the author is somebody else than the person that is being referred to. That's just simple common sense. As for the idea that Polycarp and all of them uh, said that John wrote this, they wanted to do the same thing that John uh, Torres wants to do now, to defend this as the truth from God and you know, written by eyewitness and so on. So John is really citing his own fellow apologists 
uh, while Time. he is uh, complaining against uh, other authorities. The other authorities are unbiased, and they're looking at the facts as they Time. are. This clearly was written by somebody else. Uh, first of all, uh, Polycarp. Like he knew the Apostle John. He knew John didn't write it, but he said John wrote it. Why, 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 why would he do that? Why would he believe this book if he knows that John didn't write it? How are the uh, liberal scholars who, as we've seen, deny the supernatural, who assume and presume we're supposed to accept that they're unbiased, but the people in a position to know we're biased? That does not make any sense at all. Uh, the, again, if we know that the style in that day. Popular stuff, historians, is to use third person. We see third person here. We have evidence that was written by this man, and he's using a, and the style was already known to be used in that day. There's no reason to question it. Uh, and yeah, there were Roman authorities in those, those days. There were also Jewish authorities. Saul was commissioned by the Jewish authorities to hunt down Christians and to put them to death. So there were not only Roman authorities in those days. The books are talking about what the authorities are supposed to be doing, not what they necessarily Time. do. Shabir, would you like to respond to that? Oh. I'll proceed. Oh, okay. I oh sorry. That was the final. Yes, that was my apologies. <laughs> I got confused there. Question for Shabir. In Surah 19, Ayah 33, Jesus himself says that he will die and rise again. Yet Surah 4, Ayah 157 to 158, says that Jesus didn't die. Was the Jesus of the Quran wrong when he predicted his own death and resurrection? Where could this idea have come from? So uh, Surah 19, uh, uh, the passage, the Surah 19 passage, uh, has Jesus speak these words uh, when he was young. So obviously he's referring to a future death. Commentators of the Quran who say that Jesus did not die yet say that when he returns, at that time he will die, and then his resurrection will be finally on the day of judgment with everybody else. Um, and, of course, I have followed that argumentation in showing that uh, Jesus did not quite uh, die on the cross. Uh, they thought they killed him, but uh, he did not quite die. And the Surah 4, 157 verse says, They did not kill him for certain. So I take that to be a viable interpretation of the Quran to say that Jesus uh, did not actually die and that uh, he will return, and at that time he will die. However, if a Muslim, in putting all of these passages into, in, of the Quran, uh, it, it decide that this all means that he did actually die, and even that he resurrected from the dead the way the Christian Gospels uh, say, then I wouldn't say that that person is a non-Muslim. I, I would say that that's an interpretation that's an interesting one. And in fact, it's an interpretation that is uh, now arrived at by many academic scholars. For example, Gabriel Said Reynolds, uh, Todd Lawson, uh, several scholars uh, who have written about this. Todd Lawson has written a book, uh, The Crucifixion and, uh, and the Quran. So I, if, if some such person decides, hey, I want to be a Muslim, but I believe that uh, Jesus uh, died on the cross and resurrected from the dead and met with his disciples after, after that, just like the Christian Gospels depict, I, I wouldn't say this person cannot be a Muslim uh, while holding to that belief because I would say that uh, the, the belief that I have arrived at, or the, the commentaries, rather, and interpretations that I have arrived at, uh, depends on piecing together these various pieces of the Quran in a particular way. Somebody has the right to do it in a different way. Can I see it? Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll agree with Shabir that that is actually not a contradiction. What he says, uh, which Muslims do say, is that the dying and rising is a reference to when Jesus does return. So yeah, that, that is not necessarily a, uh, a contradiction. Uh, however, uh, the point is that Jesus did die and rise. That is established by the gospel books, the New Testament books, uh, written, again, once again, by eyewitnesses in a position to know. Uh, what Shabir said there is quite interesting, that you could believe that and still be a Muslim. Well, if you believe that, then as we said, Jesus' resurrection and death authenticates him, declares him to be the son of God with power. It authenticates his entire message. And the message that Jesus brought that's faithfully recorded through divine inspiration in the gospel books is not compatible with Islam. So I'm not sure how, if you believe that, you would continue to be a Muslim. 
I would say that the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, if in fact it happened, that does not mean that he's the son of God, if you mean by that, uh, ontologically, that he's the son of God, uh, except, of course, if you mean that metaphorically God uh, loves this person, this, uh, and in that case, as, you know, if I meet a, a kid on the street and I put my hand on his head and says, my son, it doesn't, Peter says, Mar, uh, refers to Mark as his son. It doesn't mean in, in the New Testament, it doesn't mean that Mark is literally his son. But if you mean literally that Jesus is the son of God, and this is somehow declared by the resurrection. No, the resurrection from the dead, if that happened, would not prove that Jesus is the Son of God. It just proves that he's not the false Messiah. Uh, if they thought they are killing him and proving he's the false Messiah, and then God raises him from the dead and says, Look, behold, you thought you can kill my man? No, you can't kill my man. This is my beloved. This is uh, my son, even if he says that. Uh, well, then, uh, that only means metaphorically that Jesus is the Son of God, not ontologically. And this is where Muslims differ with Christians. If Christians said that Jesus is metaphorically the Son of God, we wouldn't be having a debate over it. But if you say ontologically he's the Son of God, this is the problem. The next question is for John. How can death have mastery over God? As Romans chapter 6, verse 9 says, if God is perfect, immutable, and impassable without dividing Christ into two persons with two natures, a belief that is not fully explicated to this day. If I understand the question correctly, it's not completely clear because death has absolutely no mastery over God. Uh, what happened in the incarnation, when we read in John chapter 1, verse 14, that the, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, uh, the understanding of that is the second person of the Trine God had incarnated by adding to himself a human body and nature and lived as fully God and fully man. As God, he is divine. He is all the powers of Godhood. Uh, but on his mission, he subordinated himself completely to the Father, uh, doing nothing without the Father's uh, say-so. And as a man, he was subject to all the same limitations as human beings. He got hungry, he got tired, had to sleep, he could feel pain, and he could be killed. Okay? Uh, that doesn't give mastery over, uh, give death mastery over God. Uh, this is all according to the divine plan of God. Uh, he became, his son became flesh. He's called the son. It's metaphorical in the sense that God never had a wife and, and gave birth. It's a title that's used to, to describe something about the relationship in, within the Trinity, within the triune Godhead. Uh, but it is as a man. Okay? There's a very important passage in John chapter 3, verse 13, where Jesus is speaking with Nicodemus. And he says to him, uh, no one has, has uh, ascended into heaven, but he who has descended, the Son of Man who is in heaven. Okay? Unfortunately, missing from your NIVs. Uh, but that's telling us Jesus is standing there locked in time and space speaking Nicodemus, but at the same time he continues to live as the second person of the triune Godhead. So his mission was to come as a man. He died as a man as the propitiation for sins that God accepts uh, for the forgiveness uh, of mankind. All who believe in him have forgiveness of sins and eternal time. life. If you say, uh, John, as you're saying, that, uh, uh, you know, Jesus had two natures, a divine nature and a human nature, and then as a human he died, well, then you're separating the two natures. And if you do that, then you go away from orthodoxy. Orthodoxy is such a tricky path uh, that it's hard to maintain it. Because if you say now that uh, only the human aspect of Jesus died, then you cannot turn around and say that God died for our sins. But if you say that God died for our sins, then... Uh, the problem is, how did this God actually die? How could, that questioner is right, how could death have mastery over God? And if you say that uh, the second person of the Holy Trinity died and the other two were still running the world, it means that the second person of the Holy Trinity is expendable. And by definition, God cannot be expendable, and therefore he cannot be God. Either way, you end up with a contradiction. And the best way out of this is to pronounce the monotheism, which is there in Judaism, and uh, restated in Islam, where we believe that there is only one God, uh, the one whom Christians refer to as the Father, and that Jesus is the servant and messenger of that one God. Time. Uh, there's actually absolutely no problem 
Uh, I'm not so concerned with what certain theologians might have made up as formulations. I'm only looking at what the Bible says. The Bible says that God is a, a triune being, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that the second person of the triune Godhead became flesh and dwelt among us, put up to himself a human body and human nature without ceasing to be God, and that person died. Now, you say that means God didn't die? Uh, well, what the Bible says is God did this. This is the way he did it. He added a human nature and body, and that then is a sacrifice God accepts as a propitiation for sins. To quibble and say, well, that doesn't make sense to me. I don't think God died. It means God didn't die is irrelevant. What the Bible says is this is what God did, and this is what he accepts as the propitiation for sins uh, to be taken, Romans 2.25, by faith. It's the only way to forgiveness. It's the only way to eternal life. And so we have to do it, whether or not we think it could have been done differently or whether or not we think that part's confusing. The next question for Shabir. <laughs> If Jesus was risen before he died, how do you account for the rise of the early church, which would have been based on the resurrection of Jesus? So the idea that the early church was based on the resurrection of Jesus is actually not true. And many scholars have written about this now, for example, including Stephen Patterson. Uh, what they have shown is that faith in Jesus existed before the crucifixion event. It is the Christian apologist who says that if Jesus died, that would disprove him altogether. But a Muslim would be asking about this. Why are you saying that if the Jews put Jesus to death, that disproves Jesus? So it, it, it proves that they are like unjust because they could crucify a just man who did not deserve this punishment. That doesn't prove that the man is, this is blaming the victim. Like, how can you blame J Jesus and say Jesus is false just because they crucified him? You know what the problem occurs? The problem occurs for two reasons, as I said in my opening presentation. One is that Paul said that the crucifixion proves that Jesus uh, is, uh, it dies as a curse under God's law. Well, then, of course, you need the resurrection to vindicate him. And the second problem is saying that he was the Davidic Messiah, that he went around and he was claiming that he's going to be a king. And then the charge against him was that he was the king of the Jews. That was the charge written on his cross. So if he was claiming to be king and then he didn't uh, sit on a throne, instead he was hanging on a cross, well then you have a major contradiction, you need the resurrection to vindicate him. But on the Muslim view, and on the original Christian view, as far as historians can reconstruct this, uh, that Jesus was known to be a good man, and he had many followers. Why would those followers turn around and disown him just because uh, the Jews, by hook or crook, uh, uh, violating every decency and, and, uh, and uh, norm of justice, they put him on a cross. Think about the man in John's gospel who says, Jesus healed me, and that's all I know. So he's going to believe in Jesus no matter what they do to him. So why would the Christians give up their faith in Jesus? They didn't. It was not the resurrection that gave birth Time. to the faith of Christians. It was the teachings and actions of Jesus during his lifetime on earth. And here we go uh, once again. The eyewitnesses tell us what Jesus claimed. They told us in John 2 that his proof was that he would rise from the dead. They record at least three separate times when he foretells his death and resurrection from the dead. He dies for the sins of the world. But Stephen Patterson says no. So I guess it's not true. No, that doesn't make sense, folks. Uh, what Jesus did was come and... Uh, take on titles and positions that the people saw as claims to deity, which is why the Jews wanted to kill him. He rose from the dead. That's why they followed him. What, would they give up on him? Well, did the followers of Judas give up on him? Yeah. Judas of Galilee? Yeah. Those 50 names that I put up? Yeah, every one of them stopped following. They all gave up on him. What about the followers of uh, Rabbi Menachem Schneerson? Did they give up on him? Yes, because once again, a Jewish Messiah who dies and stays dead is a fake Messiah and no one is going to follow them. Well, John has uh, actually prompted me now to explain something about this whole thing about John saying, oh, those scholars, and there we go again. 
Now, why does Stephen Patterson say that Jesus did not make these predictions? Not only Stephen Patterson. You will find many uh, scholars who are of a conservative bent. Uh, for example, uh, Kurt Allen in his book, uh, The Gospels Reconsidered. There's a collection of essays, and you will find conservative scholars, they're writing, and one of the essays is about the uh, passion predictions. Uh, essentially, in the Gospels, we have it that Jesus is saying in advance uh, that he is going to be crucified, and then he will rise again from the dead. Why are scholars saying that this is not authentic? Well, this is only in the Synoptic Gospels, but not in John. Now, in this case, John's gospel says that even after they went to the tomb, at that time, they still did not know the prophecy that Jesus was to rise from the dead. So that, uh, that's one part of the Bible disowning the other part of the Bible. So things like this make the scholars uh, conclude that this time. is not an original saying of Jesus. It was made up later. This is for John. What is the earliest extant and contemporaneous manuscript of the crucifixion that is dated multidisciplinarily and which has an accepted date range by most reformed textual critics? Uh, the earliest manuscript that includes the resurrection account would be a document that's designated P66. It's an ancient, it's the one actually that I had on my picture of the titles. Uh, it's dated variously. When it first came out, it was dated to around the year 200, uh, and that was on the basis of the belief that the codex form was not used until then. Uh, it was discovered subsequently that the codex was actually used even back into the first century. So different scholars have come at it. Uh, the dates uh, for P66 now range anywhere from 125, as early as 125 up to perhaps as, as late as 225. Uh, that's the earliest one we have. Now, by the standards of ancient uh, documents, that's extremely close to the original. Uh, what's typical for ancient writings is a gap of anywhere from 500 to 1,000 years. Uh, so what we do have is actually very close. Um, besides that, we do have quotations from witnesses or church fathers, as I mentioned, people like Papias, Arrhenius, and so on. What's significant about those is that regardless of when the manuscripts are, we know when those people lived. Uh, so they are saying the same thing. The very earliest people, Ignatius, uh, in the very early uh, first century is telling us about Jesus and, and that he is God, calling him deity. Uh, Pliny the uh, Younger, the Roman writer, again, very early in the first century, describing the acts and beliefs of Christians are saying that they sing hymns to Christ as to God. Uh, so in, once again, the documentation we have by historical standards for the life, career, death, and resurrection of Jesus is better than we have for any other ancient personage. There's no reason to doubt it. There's no historic, historiographical reason to doubt it. The difference is that we're not called upon to rest our eternal salvation in believing in any one of those emperors or ancient persons. When we're being called upon to rest our eternal salvation on belief in Jesus, we want to know the facts about him. And the earliest written proclamation we have about Jesus being resurrected from the dead is in Paul's writings. And we saw that earlier that Paul was viewed with some suspicion on the part of the original disciples of Jesus. So that's the question mark. If we go to the gospel writings and the Acts of the Apostles, we see that the original disciples of Jesus, uh, after having received many visitations from Jesus, did not immediately apparently proclaim this to the public. It is only 50 days after the crucifixion event that they make their first public pro proclamation. Now, Christians might be thinking, well, wait a minute. If they had uh, proclaimed this from the start, you would expect people can go and visit the tomb and see for themselves that the tomb is empty. But they say nothing to anybody until 50 days later. Who Who's going to check then and what are you going to find and how are you going to know if the Jesus's body is still there or some other body or, or what has happened so Time. it's without verification okay. uh, <clears throat> it is true indeed if we get something wrong about uh, a Roman Emperor it's not going to materially affect our lives okay uh, if we get something wrong about Jesus, though, it will affect not just your life, but your eternal destiny. Uh, so once again, the weight of the evidence, does it come down on his side or not? Uh, the earliest manuscript we have maybe dates to 125. Does that mean it's not reliable? 
the quotes from the church fathers. Does this take us to a 50% confidence level, 50% plus one? Because if it does, if you continue to reject it, then uh, your chances of being lost eternally is greater than of not being lost eternally. Um, and again, we keep hearing Paul's earliest, I showed you hard evidence that Matthew, Mark, and Luke were written before the earliest of Paul's letters. Shabir has not given any countervailing evidence to, to controvert that. He just keeps saying Paul was first. Time. Both speakers have answered an equal amount of questions. Uh, given the time that we have, this will be the final question. It is addressed to both speakers. Um, in this case, then, would both speakers be comfortable with equally having two minutes, then, to answer this final question? Sure. The question is, this is actually a question we received online through the online chat, through the live stream. Given all of the evidence that has been presented, what more or other evidence would you need to finally believe the position that you are opposing? Shabir, would you like to go first? Sure. So uh, what evidence would I want to um, uh, then believe that Jesus resurrected physically, bodily uh, from the dead? Well, we would need uh, very early reports attested from eyewitnesses. And uh, um, this we don't, we don't have. Uh, uh, on the other hand, if, uh, if we take Paul's statement that Jesus uh, appeared to him, uh, then it would seem that Paul is speaking about a non-physical uh, resurrection from the dead. Uh, it's, uh, Paul speaks of a revelation that God gave him. Paul, in his writings, does not speak about the Damascus Road experience. It's Acts of the Apostles that does that. And uh, generally, scholars find a discrepancy between what Paul wrote in his own letters and what Acts of the Apostles uh, is writing about Paul. And in such cases, they prefer to go with Paul. Paul does not mention the Damascus Road experience, but he said, God revealed his son to me. So Paul speaks of a revelation, something like a vision that he saw. In which case, Paul, if you follow his argumentation, he's not speaking about a physical exit of Jesus from, from the grave, but he's speaking about a, a spiritual uh, resurrection from the dead. Uh, Paul himself spoke about the tent of uh, our bodies. So we live like we're a spirit that lives in the tent and that Christians will be given new bodies which are prepared for them in heaven. So it's not the body that is left here on, on earth. Paul himself uh, uh, says that uh, it's not the seed that is planted that grows, uh, that, that becomes the plant. It is something else. Of course, his uh, chemistry here, our biology might be questionable, but his point is clear. That body which is put on the ground that is gone and dead and rotting, but uh, God brings out a new person uh, from, uh, from the grave. And why do we think that Paul is the earliest proclamation? Why do I not follow the earlier datings that uh, John has put forward? This is modern scholarship, folks. Get the, the program. Get the memo. Okay. Thank you. And this is why, folks, I keep saying you have to look at what is the evidence the scholars offer for that. What is the evidence the scholars offer that Paul's eyes were, were first? Well, they don't. This is why I keep asking, but Shabir keeps not giving it. Okay. Do not go with that. Go with the evidence. Now, to answer the actual question, uh, the thing is, Jesus authenticated his message by rising from the dead. I made the point in my presentation earlier. He's the only one who did that. Everyone, every messenger claiming to be a messenger from God, claiming they are bringing God's message, eternal life, victory over death, every one of them is dead. And he's in his grave. And the question then is, why should I believe that his message will beat death for me when I see him dead compared to one who came back from the dead? Uh, the only way you could give up on that is per 1 Corinthians 15, where the Bible itself instructs of us that if Christ is not risen, our faith is vain. Uh, I think the evidence for the resurrection of Christ is so overall, I cannot see what kind of countervailing evidence could come forth. But in theory, that's the only thing. Now, to believe the other side, I would have to believe that the uh, Quran was actually sent down from God to uh, Muhammad and faithfully recorded to us. But the question is, why would I believe that? What is the authenticating information? Uh, if there was compelling information, that's one thing. But I I've looked carefully at the claims, the, the proofs, attempted proofs made by Shabir and, and others. I don't find them compelling. Uh, 
even if you take it back, if we believe everything you read in the hadiths and the tafsir and sirats and so on, the furthest back you could go is that Muhammad was approached by a spirit being in a cave, given a message. If we accept that, we still can't know that was a good spirit. Time. John Torres, uh, Dr. Shabir Lee, thank you so much for your time to discuss this subject, and thank you uh, for also giving us a great example of a good civilized discussion on friendly terms.